now can all of you hear me now i just wanted to see whether you can hear me uh hold on just let me know whether i am audible now can all of you hear me yes okay thank you okay now okay 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 so uh, starting the session without wasting much time today's session it will be available on youtube for tomorrow as well and i'm going to take 3 years pyqs with you june fmg 2021 session then december 2021 session and uh, december uh, june 2022 session right so these are the three sessions we are going to take first we are going to cover questions of june 2021 session so question number 1 and in turn conducts a delivery and <clears throat> immediately after delivery patient experiences breathlessness hypotension tachycardia and she collapses per vaginal examination is normal and there is no excessive blood loss what is the probable diagnosis ab ye jitni bhi obstetrical emergencies hoti hain us pe a lot many times questions are being asked these days right so whenever you get a question on postpartum collapse ya question says patient goes into shock after delivery there can be three possibilities number 1 pph number 2 uterine inversion number 3 amniotic fluid embolism ab question ki language se kaise pata lagega ki what is the condition agar question mein most common cause pucha gaya hai it is pph agar question mein diya gaya hai ki patient has gone into collapse after excessive bleeding then also this is pph if the question says ki excessive bleeding hai and uterus is not palpable on per abdominal examination that means it is a case of atonic pph and again you are going to mark the answer as pph on the other hand agar question mein word aaya hai immediate shock after delivery then most of the times you are going to think about uterine inversion in case of uterine inversion jo shock hoga that will be out of proportion to bleeding per abdominal examination may a cup like depression will be felt and per vaginal examination may something round will be felt in the vagina then comes the third cause that is amniotic fluid embolism right ab amniotic fluid embolism may uh, the one word which you might get is unexplained shock so if your question says unexplained shock after delivery mark the answer as amniotic fluid embolism now there is one typical feature jo kisi bhi aur case mein nahi milta keval amniotic fluid embolism mein milta hai that is breathlessness so in case of amniotic fluid embolism you are going to get breathlessness and there is going to be heart failure so agar question mein breathlessness ke sath heart failure ke features diye hain definitely the answer is amniotic fluid embolism please remember amniotic fluid embolism mein पर अबडोमल एग्जामिनेशन नॉर्मल होगा पर विजाइनल एग्जामिनेशन नॉर्मल होगा एज फार एज ब्लीडिंग इज कंसर्न रिमेंबर एमनियोटिक फ्लूड एम्बोलिज्म के दो फेजेस होते हैं इन द फर्स्ट फेज पेशेंट में ब्रेथलेसनेस मिलती है एंड हार्ट फेलियर मिलता है जिसमें ब्लीडिंग कम होती है सेकेंड फेज में पेशेंट हैज डीआईसी जिसमें ब्लीडिंग ज्यादा होती है तो इन एमनियोटिक फ्लूड एम्बोलिज्म there can be excessive bleeding they cannot be excessive bleeding right first phase mein excessive bleeding nahi hogi second phase mein excessive bleeding hogi now in your case number one they are saying immediately after delivery jab humne immediately after delivery padha my mind said it could be a case of uterine inversion lekin next usme diya hai ki patient is having breathlessness hypotension tachycardia breathlessness hypotension tachycardia milta hai amniotic fluid embolism mein right so now i want to know whether my patient is having amniotic fluid embolism ya uterine inversion aage dekho per vaginal examination normal diya hai jabki uterine inversion ke case mein per vaginal examination mein some round mass will be felt inside the vagina fundus will be felt inside the vagina so per vaginal examination kabhi bhi normal nahi hoga so remember this message ki kabhi bhi breathlessness diya ho heart failure ke features diye ho and patient has gone into shock it means you are dealing with amniotic fluid embolism right so this is a case of amniotic fluid embolism and this is not a case of uterine inversion 
please do not write that explain in english explain in english i will use both the languages and i will explain it to you right then comes second pelvis associated with persistent occipital posterior position now whenever you get a question on pelvis and your question is saying occipital posterior position occipital posterior position uh abhinandan i will repeat only this much that if your question is saying breathlessness and collapse so patient has gone into collapse and your question says breathlessness that means it is amniotic fluid embolism right in case of amniotic fluid embolism per abdominal examination normal hoga per vaginal examination normal hoga uterine inversion ke case mein kabhi bhi breathlessness nahi milega uterine inversion ke case mein per vaginal examination can never be normal kyunki uterine inversion ka matlab hai ki uterus ka fundus jo hai wo invert kar gaya hai and jab uterus ka fundus invert karega to on per vaginal examination you will get something round felt inside the vagina and that round is nothing but that round mass is fundus of the uterus right ab why is this not a case of pph ye pph kyu nahi hai ye pph isliye nahi hai kyunki question mein diya hai ki there is no excessive blood loss clear to all of you okay coming to questions related to occipital posterior position agar question aata hai in which pelvis occipital posterior position is common your answer will be android pelvis in which pelvis deep transverse arrest is common android pelvis rat lo is cheez ko but agar question says persistent occipital posterior position ya direct occipital posterior position occipital posterior position ke aage koi bhi prefix add ho gaya wo prefix chahe persistent ho chahe direct ho now your answer will change to anthropoid pelvis राइट केवल ऑक्सीपिटो पोस्टीरियर पूछेंगे तो योर आंसर इज एंड्रॉइड पेल्विस परसिस्टेंट ऑक्सीपिटो पोस्टीरियर पूछेंगे या डायरेक्ट ऑक्सीपिटो पोस्टीरियर पूछेंगे एंथ्रोपॉइड पेल्विस फेस प्रेजेंटेशन किसमें कॉमन होता है प्लैटी पिल्लॉइड पेल्विस अब बहुत केयरफुली आंसर करना If they ask you face presentation is common in your answer will be platypilloid pelvis but if they say face to pubes delivery is common in your answer is going to be anthropoid pelvis right clear okay coming to question number 3 a female has previous history of cesarean section prolonged labor she is hypotensive fetal heart sounds cannot be heard and fetal parts are superficially palpable the diagnosis is ab yahan pe bahut clear cut question diya hai and question keh raha hai that there is previous history of cesarean section mother mein hypotension mil raha hai tachycardia mil raha hai on per abdominal examination क्वेश्चन कह रहा है फीटल पार्ट्स आर फेल्ट सुपरफिशियली प्लीज रिमेंबर जब भी क्वेश्चन ये कहे कि प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री है सिजेरियन सेक्शन की एंड मदर में विजाइनल डिलीवरी करा रहे थे हम एंड नाउ मदर इज गोइंग इन टू शॉक फीटल हार्ट रेट मदर की हार्ट रेट इंक्रीज हो रही है मदर का बीपी डिक्रीज हो रहा है पर अबडोमल एग्जामिनेशन में फीटल पार्ट आर फेल्ट सुपरफिशियली इट मीन्स की यूट्रस रक्चर कर गया है तभी फीटल पार्ट सुपरफिशियली फेल्ट हो रहे हैं एंड दैट इज वाई मदर हैज गॉन इन टू शॉक now instead of saying this that the fetal parts are felt superficially your question next time day after tomorrow can say that uterine contractions are not felt and a gap is felt in the uterus to so, agar ye bhi de rahe hain ki a gap is felt in the uterus then again it means it's a case of uterine rupture in a case of uterine rupture fetal heart sounds will not be heard पर विजाइनल एग्जामिनेशन में हिमचूरिया मिलेगा फ्रेश ब्लीडिंग मिलेगी एंड 
abhi tak jab when we were doing per vaginal examination fetal head was being felt lekin jab once the uterus ruptures fetus is lying in the peritoneal cavity to ab jab hum per vaginal examination karenge you will not feel fetal head ab ye question mein kaise diya hoga in the question it will be written as loss of fetal station so if you get this line there is loss of fetal station immediately it means it is uterine rupture gap ka matlab hai ki uterus jab rupture hoga to uterus mein ek gap feel hoga na koi bhi cheez phat rahi hai koi bhi cheez rupture ho rahi hai to ek gap feel hoga right now this should be very much distinguished from अनदर सिचुएशन अगर आपका क्वेश्चन ये कहता है दैट मदर इज इन प्रोलॉन्ग्ड लेबर एंड आफ्टर प्रोलॉन्ग्ड लेबर जब पर अबडोमल एग्जामिनेशन किया तो अपर सेगमेंट इज कॉन्ट्रैक्टेड एंड लोअर सेगमेंट इज रिलैक्स बैंडल्स रिंग इज फेल्ट now the moment your question says bandel's ring is felt then it is not a case of uterine rupture bandel's ring feel hoti hai in case of obstructed labor right to obstructed labor agar hoga to question mein bandel's ring diya hoga question mein diya hoga ki there is hot dry vagina and foul smelling discharge यूट्राइन रप्चर के केस में दिया होगा फीटल पार्ट आर फेल्ट सुपरफिशियली ऑन पर विजाइनल एग्जामिनेशन देर इज लॉस ऑफ फीटल स्टेशन राइट यूट्राइन रप्चर का मैनेजमेंट है कि इमेजिट लेप्रोटमी करो ऑब्स्ट्रक्टेड लेबर का मैनेजमेंट है कि इमेजिट सिजेरियन सेक्शन करो क्लियर टू ऑल ऑफ यू यस So, यहां पे क्योंकि दिया है फीटल हार्ट साउंड आर नॉट हर्ड एंड फीटल पार्ट आर पैल्पेबल सुपरफिशियली इट मीन्स इट्स अ केस ऑफ यूट्राइन रप्चर क्लियर टू ऑल ऑफ यू यस नाउ वाई कैन नॉट इट बी हाइड्रो एमनियोस हाइड्रो एमनियोस का मतलब है एक्सेसिव एमनियोटिक फ्लूड जब एक्सेसिव एमनियोटिक फ्लूड है तो फीटल हार्ट साउंड नहीं सुनाई देंगे अग्रीड लेकिन पॉलीहाइड्रामनियोस के केस में पेशेंट हाइपोटेंसिव क्यों होगी राइट वाई इज शी गोइंग इन टू शॉक नंबर वन वाई आर दे सेंग फीटल पार्ट आर फेल्ट सुपरफिशियली राइट हाइड्रामनियोस का मतलब है कि आप फीटल पार्ट्स फील ही नहीं कर पाओगे सुपरफिशियली तो दूर की बात क्लियर टू ऑल ऑफ यू यस नाउ नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नाउ समवन इज आस्किंग कि इफ देर इज यूट्राइन रप्चर तो क्या होगा यूट्राइन रप्चर होगा तो फीटल डेथ हो जाएगी एंड आप लेप्रोटमी करोगे फीट जो डेड फीटस है उसको बाहर निकालोगे एंड यूट्रस को स्टिच करोगे राइट right? या उसकी हिस्ट्रेक्टमी कर दोगे अगर यूट्रस रिपेयरेबल कंडीशन में नहीं होगा तो देन 32 वीक्स प्रेग्नेंट फीमेल कंप्लेन ऑफ विजाइनल ब्लीडिंग राइट ऑन पर अबडोमल एग्जामिनेशन यूट्रस इज टेंडर फीटल हार्ट साउंड आर एब्सेंट नाउ प्लीज रिमेंबर वेन एवर योर क्वेश्चन सेज that there is bleeding beyond 28 weeks that means they are talking about antepartum hemorrhage antepartum hemorrhage ka differential diagnosis hota hai preterm labor preterm labor and antepartum hemorrhage ko hame distinguish karte hue chalna hota hai now in antepartum hemorrhage there can be two conditions i am sure all of you know that placenta previa abruptio placenta placenta previa mein kaisi bleeding hoti hai painless bleeding hoti hai koi reason nahi hota us bleeding ka bleeding is bright red in color uterus is non tender fetal heart sounds are easily heard and height of the uterus is equal to the period of gestation in case of placenta previa per vaginal examination is contraindicated but the investigation of choice is tbs whereas in case of abruptio there will be bleeding but bleeding ke sath pain in abdomen present hoga there will be history of trauma or pih then bleeding will be dull red in color uterus will be tensed and rigid that is why fetal heart sounds will not be able to hear here 
and because of concealed variety of bleeding part or height of the uterus will be more than period of gestation in case of abruptio per vaginal examination is not contraindicated ab antepartum hemorrhage ke case ko preterm labor se kaise distinguish karoge now preterm labor may be bleeding milti hai but that is actually show it is blood mixed mucus discharge and jab patient preterm labor mein hogi to fetal heart sounds normal honge height of the uterus will be equal to the पीरियड ऑफ जेस्टेशन यूट्रस कॉन्ट्रैक्ट करेगा एंड रिलैक्स करेगा ऐसा कभी भी नहीं होगा कि यूट्रस टेंस एंड रिजिड होगा and when you will do per vaginal examination you will see that the cervix is progressively dilating to dheere dheere cervix dilate ho raha hai so that means you are dealing with preterm labor ab is case mein per abdominal examination mein uterus is tender a fetal heart sounds are absent and bleeding hai so this means this is a case of abruptio it is not a case of preterm labor why it is not a case of preterm labor kyunki fetal heart sounds normal honi chahiye uterus tender nahi hoga uterus contract and relax karega right it is not a case of placenta previa kyunki placenta previa ke case mein uterus kabhi bhi tender nahi hota it is not a case of uterine rupture kyunki uterine rupture प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री ऑफ सिजेरियन सेक्शन के पेशेंट्स में मिलता है यहां पे ऐसी कोई हिस्ट्री इन्होंने दी नहीं है राइट एंड यूट्राइन रप्चर मिलता है जब प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री ऑफ सिजेरियन सेक्शन के पेशेंट्स दे गो डिलीवरी दे आर डिलीवरिंग उस टाइम पे मिलता है कभी भी ऐसे ही ड्यूरिंग प्रेगनेंसी यू डोंट गेट यूट्राइन रप्चर राइट सो इन यूट्राइन रप्चर यू विल गेट the question will specifically tell you दैट देर इज प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री ऑफ सिजेरियन सेक्शन एंड क्वेश्चन इज गोइंग टू टेल यू दैट patient is now in labor right uterus doesn't rupture spontaneously during pregnancy there has to be a reason for the uterus to rupture clear now coming to question 5 a pregnant female visits antenatal opd for the first time at 18 weeks of pregnancy her fundal height corresponds to 16 weeks in other words the question is saying that the height of the uterus is less than the period of gestation right so you have to tell me what are the conditions in which height of the uterus is less than the period of gestation number 1 if it is you know wrong dates so if patient doesn't know her dates then in case of intra uterine death of the fetus in case of iugr in case of transverse lie and in case of oligohydramnios right now in this case the question is asking you in which of the following conditions you are going to get height of the uterus less so please remember fetal renal agenesis leads to oligohydramnios fetal anemia anencephaly and barter syndrome all of them they lead to polyhydramnios and in polyhydramnios height of the uterus is more than the period of gestation barter syndrome is one renal condition of the fetus in which you get polyhydramnios otherwise in all renal conditions of the fetus you get oligohydramnios barter syndrome is one renal condition of the fetus where you get polyhydramnios and if you are a marrow subscriber you know i have taught everything there in your marrow videos right coming to the next question a 25 year old uh, p1 l1 delivered 12 weeks back and she gives history of continuous heavy bleeding per vagina she has history of dilatation and curettage in some private hospital the most likely explanation for the bleeding is so i will come to this in a moment that what is the answer but first tell me if a patient is coming to you with bleeding right after delivery most of the times that's a lochia right and lochia when is lochia normally seen what is lochia lochia is shedding of decidua after delivery normal time for lochia is 24 to 36 days very very important remember this for your upcoming exam second important thing is the sequence of lochia lochia rubra then serosa and then alba right then uh, so lochia cannot continue up till 12 weeks this patient is she had delivered 12 weeks back so this cannot be a case of lochia 
right then comes pph now pph can be primary pph primary pph happens within 24 hours of delivery or secondary pph secondary pph happens from 24 hours to 12 weeks after delivery and since this patient delivered 12 week back i may think that this is a case of secondary pph now the most common cause of primary pph is atonic uterus most common cause of secondary pph is retained placental tissue and management of retained placental tissue is ki aap dnc kar do right if some part of the placenta is retained inside if some tissue is retained inside when i will do a curettage that part will come out right and now question is saying that she had undergone a dnc but still she is bleeding so this means i can rule out pph that she is not a case of pph right because if she would have been a case of pph after dnc her bleeding would have stopped right is that clear to you now then comes has she developed dic do you think a patient of dic presents to you like this that for 12 weeks she has been bleeding and patient is coming to you with vitals stable telling you that i have been bleeding for past 12 weeks no dic is an emergency situation patient comes to you with excessive bleeding and in shock right so it cannot be a case of dic right this means by ruling out all the other options this is a case of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia please remember that gtn most commonly develops after h mole evacuation most commonly they are going to develop after h mole evacuation and the most common gtn to develop after h mole evacuation is invasive mole please do not say corio carcinoma but then gtn can also happen after abortion gtn can happen after ectopic pregnancy gtn can happen after normal delivery and the most common gtn after normal delivery is corio carcinoma overall the most common gtn is invasive mole so whenever a patient comes to you with persistent bleeding after molar evacuation or persistent bleeding after normal delivery or after evacuate or after abortion or after ectopic pregnancy one of the differential diagnoses is gtn clear to all of you yes okay then a 25 year old primary gravida is on lithium for treatment of psychiatric illness for past 2 years the most common anomaly seen in fetus uh, with a mother who has taken lithium during pregnancy is this is a very very straightforward question if you are a marrow subscriber i have taught you this that lithium leads to epstein anomaly right now this over here i am telling you most important drugs and their teratogenic effects lithium leads to epstein anomaly and in epstein anomaly anomaly there is malfunctioning of the tricuspid valve warfarin leads to warfarin embryopathy in warfarin embryopathy hame cartilage formation defective milta hai there is chondrodysplasia which is seen in warfarin which is going to affect the cartilage cartilage is not formed so you get nasal cartilage hypoplasia nasal bone hypoplasia and you get stippled epiphyses mesoprost ka use leads to mobius syndrome retinoic acid that drugs like isotret they lead to anosia or microtia thalidomide leads to phocomelia in phocomelia you have proximal limb defect right so that there is a proximal limb defect in phocomelia then alcohol use leads to fetal alcohol syndrome in fetal alcohol syndrome you will get growth restriction microcephaly small head and typical facial features in typical facial features you have small eyes a smooth philtrum and a thin upper lip right so these are the features which you get with fetal alcohol syndrome growth restriction 
plus microcephaly plus typical facial features right and phenytoin use leads to fetal hyden toin syndrome in fetal hyden toin syndrome again there is going to be microcephaly there can be cleft lip cleft palate and underdeveloped fingers right so this table over here i want all of you to quickly take a screenshot of this table over here and just revise it before you sleep today yes okay coming to next question a 26 year old female with mechanical valve on warfarin therapy has a pregnancy test positive the best advice to give her is very very important is anticoagulant used during pregnancy now if the patient has a bioprosthetic valve please remember bioprosthetic valve ka patient mein pregnancy ke time pe no anticoagulant is needed and normally also no anticoagulant is needed for bioprosthetic valves the only thing which you need to give to patients of bioprosthetic valves is aspirin coming to mechanical valves mechan jaisa ki question mein diya hai she had mechanical valve mechanical valve ke patient ko anticoagulant bhi dena hai during pregnancy and aspirin also has to be given during pregnancy in first trimester the best thing to do is to put her on low molecular weight heparin right or if the dose of warfarin is less than 5 mg you may continue warfarin but the best thing is to switch over to low molecular weight heparin this is something which is new which has come up that warfarin if the dose of warfarin is less than 5 mg per day it can be continued in first trimester right now jaise hi first trimester over hota hai and patient comes to 12 weeks then between 12 weeks to 30 to 6 weeks every patient is given all pregnant females with mechanical valves are given warfarin then at 36 weeks you are going to change and you are going to again put her on low molecular weight heparin why please remember two basic differences between warfarin and heparin warfarin can cross the placenta right that is a big problem with warfarin but warfarin is a very strong anticoagulant drug and pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state kyunki pregnancy hypercoagulable state hoti hai so i need a strong anticoagulant that is why jaise hi 12 weeks over hote hain i put my patient on warfarin because i need a strong anticoagulant now at 36 weeks again i put my patient on low molecular weight heparin why because if patient is on warfarin warfarin is a very strong anticoagulant drug and that can lead to pph so again at 36 weeks you have to shift your patient to low molecular weight heparin and you have to stop low molecular weight heparin 24 hours before vaginal delivery or cesarean section when do you restart anticoagulant you restart anticoagulant 6 hours after vaginal delivery or 6 to 12 hours after cesarean section in practice we start after 24 hours of cesarean section right now jab hum start karenge to hum heparin and warfarin ko ek sath start karenge and once inr is achieved 2 to 2.5 ka inr achieve ho gaya then i am going to stop heparin and continue warfarin why did i start heparin and warfarin after delivery this is because warfarin takes time to act jabki heparin immediately act kar leti hai so immediately act karne ke liye i started with heparin and then i also added warfarin and ek baar once the inr is stabilized i stop heparin and i continue her throughout her life on warfarin right now suppose your patient doesn't come to you at 36 weeks and patient is on warfarin at the time of delivery and they ask you what is the next step so please remember if the patient is on warfarin at the time of labor you have to stop warfarin you have to do a cesarean section you are not going to do a vaginal delivery and you are going to give vitamin k to the mother and vitamin k to the neonate once the baby is born right clear to all of you ha uh, uh, alize i told that you should stop 
uh, low molecular weight heparin one week before delivery and switch over to unfractionated heparin that is basically for uh, neat pg students as an fmg student you just need to remember ki 36 weeks pe hum low molecular weight heparin start kar dete hain why i am saying ki as an fmg student you need to remember this because fmg students mein they are going to follow datta what datta says and datta say doesn't tell you to uh, switch over to unfractionated heparin right okay coming to the next question the complication which is associated with iv bolus injection of oxytocin now please remember oxytocin you should never give it iv bolus why you should not give it iv bolus because it leads to hypotension and ultimately it can lead to cardiac arrest the other thing which you have to remember is oxytocin you have to give it im or you have to give it as iv infusion right and when you are making an iv infusion you are going to make that infusion in ringer lactate or normal saline and you are not going to make the infusion in dextrose 5% solution why not in dextrose 5% solution because it can lead to water intoxication water intoxication right that is why you are not going to use it in dextrose 5% right so iv bolus you don't give it because it leads to hypotension dextrose 5% mein nahi banate hain because it can lead to water intoxication right now quickly i want all of you to revise contra indications for methyl ergotamethrin so if you are a marrow subscriber i have told you the mnemonic for contra indications of methyl ergotamethrin they are t o p e r what is t t is after delivery of first twin you can give methyl ergotamethrin after delivery of second twin but not after delivery of first twin o stands for organic heart disease or any heart disease p for preeclampsia e for eclampsia and r for rh negative pregnancy now someone has asked me that why don't you give heparin in second trimester as i told you warfarin is a strong anticoagulant heparin is a weak anticoagulant राइट एंड प्रेगनेंसी जो होती है वो हाइपर क्वागबल स्टेट होती है प्रेगनेंसी में ऑल क्लॉटिंग फैक्टर्स आर इंक्रीज सो देर आर वेरी हाई चांसेस ऑफ थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिज्म इन प्रेगनेंसी दैट इज वाई हम वॉरफेरिन को स्टार्ट कर देते हैं फ्रॉम ट्वेल्व वीक्स बिकॉज अगर हम हिपैरिन कंटिन्यू रखेंगे हिपैरिन बींग वीक एंटी क्वागलेंट दे विल बी हाई चांसेस ऑफ थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिज्म clear okay so have you understood this uh, contraindications of methyl ergometrin coming to next question this is again a question which we do very oftenly in uh, the maro videos false statement regarding the instrument which is shown in the image now what instrument is shown in the image the instrument which is shown in the image is mva syringe that is manual vacuum aspiration syringe right now there are two syringes one is manual vacuum aspiration syringe other is menstrual regulation syringe dono ke beech mein डिफरेंस ये होता है कि मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन सिरिंज में दो पिंच वाल्व्स मिलते हैं मेंस्ट्रुअल रेगुलेशन सिरिंज में यू गेट अ सिंगल पिंच वाल्व नाउ नाउ अड इज वॉट हैज स्टार्टेड हैपनिंग ये अभी तक था अब वॉट हैज स्टार्टेड हैपनिंग इज कि जो मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन सिरिंज है उसमें यू मे गेट अ सिंगल पिंच वाल्व और यू मे गेट टू पिंच वाल्व एंड जो मेंस्ट्रुअल रेगुलेशन सिरिंज है वो एक नॉर्मल सिरिंज बन गई है सो so नाउ अगर आपके पास क्वेश्चन आता है चाहे वो ये सिरिंज दिखाएं चाहे वो ये सिरिंज दिखाएं इट मीन्स इट इज मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन सिरिंज राइट मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन सिरिंज की कैपेसिटी इज सिक्सटी एम 
प्रेशर जो ये सिरिंज जेनरेट करती है बेस्ट आंसर इज 660 सिक्सटी मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्करी इफ 660 सिक्सटी इज नॉट गिवन देन द सेकेंड बेस्ट आंसर इज 600 हंड्रेड मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्यूरी राइट एंड इस सिरिंज को हम टिल 12 वीक्स ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी यूज कर सकते हैं नाउ प्लीज रिमेंबर दैट वेन यू आर डूइंग एम टी पी अप टिल सेवन वीक्स जो बेस्ट मेथड होता है एम टी पी का दैट इज मेडिकल अबॉर्शन सेवन वीक्स से ट्वेल्व वीक्स के बीच में बेस्ट मेथड इज सक्शन इवैक्युएशन एंड ये सक्शन इवैक्युएशन हम करते हैं विद द हेल्प ऑफ कार्मन कैनुला एक प्लास्टिक कैनुला होता है कार्मन कैनुला जिस पे क्वेश्चन आया है एंड आई शो यू जस्ट नाउ एंड दिस कैनुला इज अटैच टू अ सक्शन मशीन जो कि प्रेशर जेनरेट करती है सक्शन इवैक्युएशन के लिए इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इज नीडेड राइट टू रन दिस सक्शन मशीन सो रूरल एरियाज में जो ऑल्टरनेटिव होता है टू सक्शन इवैक्युएशन दैट इज मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन मैनुअल वैक्यूम एस्पिरेशन में ये सिरिंज यूज करते हैं एंड ये सिरिंज जो है ये प्रेशर जेनरेट करती है कितना प्रेशर जेनरेट करती है 660 मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्यूरी 660 ऑप्शन में नहीं दिया है तो सेकंड बेस्ट आंसर इज 600 मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्यूरी राइट सो इट डजेंट नीड इलेक्ट्रिसिटी दिस इज राइट it creates a pressure of 650 mm of mercury right its ki capacity 30 ml hoti hai wrong ye jo syringe hoti hai iski capacity hoti hai 60 ml and it can be used for mtp up till 12 weeks right okay now coming to next question a g4 woman who is 24 year old presents at 22 weeks with previous history of three mid trimester abortions on ultrasound her cervical length is 20 mm what could be the most probable cause of her recurrent pregnancy loss right so over here प्लीज रिमेंबर रिकरेंट प्रेगनेंसी लॉस का मतलब है मोर देन इक्वल टू थ्री लॉसेज ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी एंड अगर अल्ट्रासाउंड ने कंफर्म करा था प्रेगनेंसी को सो इट मीन मोर देन इक्वल टू टू लॉसेज ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी नाउ रिकरेंट प्रेगनेंसी लॉस का या रिकरेंट अबॉर्शन का मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज और मोस्ट कॉमन ग्रुप विच कैन लीड टू रिकरेंट प्रेगनेंसी लॉस इज एंडोक्रीन प्रॉब्लम फॉलोड बाय यूट्राइन प्रॉब्लम right so endocrine problems are the most common reason for recurrent pregnancy loss but if they ask you ab endocrine causes mein bahut sare causes aate hain so if they ask you the most common single cause for recurrent pregnancy loss it is apla what do you mean by apla anti phospholipid antibody syndrome right now if the question comes most common cause of second trimester recurrent pregnancy loss second trimester recurrent pregnancy loss is due to cervical incompetence cervical incompetence mein patient complains of painless abortion and kabhi bhi agar aapko patient history de rahi hai two second trimester recurrent abortions so without any further investigation it means she is a case of cervical incompetence two second trimester recurrent abortions lekin agar patient aapko history de rahi hai single second trimester recurrent abortion ki to in that case you have to look at the length of the cervix and if length of the cervix is less than 20 5 mm then that's a case of cervical incompetence so this over here is a clear cut case of cervical incompetence because there is history of 3 second trimester abortions and there is cervical length is 20 mm please remember diagnosis ke liye ya to 2 second trimester abortions hone chahiye टू सेकेंड ट्राइमेस्टर अबॉर्शन है तो इट इज श्योर कट केस ऑफ क्लियर कट केस ऑफ सर्वाइकल इनकॉम्पिटेंस और वन सेकेंड ट्राइमेस्टर अबॉर्शन प्लस लेंथ ऑफ द सर्विक्स लेस देन ट्वेंटी फाइव मिलीमीटर्स नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन अ ट्वेंटी फोर इयर ओल्ड प्राइमरी ग्रेविडा इज हैविंग पेन एंड अबडोम हर सर्विक्स इज 
1 cm dilated 20% effaced after 10 hours her findings are same fetal heart sounds is normal and regular what is the next step in management so over here quickly i'll tell you a few things first stage of labor ka matlab hai up till the cervix becomes 10 cm dilated first stage mein there is latent phase and active phase According to ACOG, latent phase is up till 5 cm and active phase begins at 6 cm. The recent WHO guidelines are which are new partogram based. Hai. So this is a very very important question. New partogram which is called as labor care guide is based on new WHO recommendations and according to new WHO recommendations, active phase begins at 5 centimeters. So, perso agar you get a question that in partogram, in the new partogram, plotting is going to begin from, so plotting begins from 5 centimeters. Do not say 4 centimeters, right? Now, latent phase of labor ko prolonged kehte hain if it is more than 20 hours in a nulliparous female or more than 14 hours in a multiparous female. Prolonged latent phase ka management hota hai, you have to sedate the patient, you don't do any cesarean section. Ab yaha pe your patient is just 1 centimeter dilated and 10 hours hi hoi abhi. Right? So, in this case, mein hum kya karenge? am I going to start oxytocin? Am I going to do ARM? Am I going to do cesarean section? No. I am going to sedate the patient. Please remember, ARM kab karte hain ya oxytocin kab dete hain? ARM ya oxytocin is given for protracted active phase. Protracted active phase ka matlab hota hai, if dilatation is less than 1 cm per hour in active phase. So, if your question says that patient is in active phase and the dilatation which is happening is less than 1 cm per hour, then your answer will be ARM or oxytocin. Caesarean section answer kab hoga? Caesarean section answer hoga, agar question mein fetal distress diya hai, then you are going to do, say I am going to do a caesarean section. Ya agar question mein diya hai, ki patient active phase of labor mein hai, 4 hours have passed. And there is no further dilatation, which is called as active phase arrest, right? So, active phase arrest ka matlab hai ki patient active phase mein hai, 4 hours ho gaye hai and koi bhi dilatation nahi hua. So, suppose patient was 6 centimeters dilated at 6 o'clock. 10 o'clock ho gaye and patient abhi bhi 6 centimeters dilated hai in spite of good uterine contractions and in spite of the fact ki membranes ruptured hai. So, now my answer is going to be cesarean section. Clear to all of you? Okay. Have you understood when your answer is going to be oxytocin, when it is going to be ARM and when it is going to be cesarean section? Coming to the next question. A 23-year-old primary gravida presents at 19 weeks of pregnancy. She has no significant medical history. Her family history is significant for diabetes running in the family. So, she has family history of diabetes. Right? Her ECG is normal. And urine analysis is normal. Fasting blood sugar 126, HbAc 6.5. A patient is at 19 weeks of pregnancy and her fasting blood sugar is 126 and HbAc 6.5. She has uh, diabetes running in the family. Please remember that jo gestational diabetes hoti hai, gestational diabetes kis time pe manifest karti hai? Gestational diabetes manifest karti hai at between 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy, right? Usse pehle agar diabetes ho rahi hai, to it could be a case of pre-gestational diabetes. Pre-gestational diabetes ki diagnosis ke liye very very important. Ye dono points yaad kar lo. Fasting blood sugar more than equal to 126. Ye normal diabetes ka criteria. You all know that in non-pregnant females, males, that is how you come to know. Ki fasting blood sugar more than 126 and 2 RPP more than equal to 200. HbAc more than equal to 6.5. 
this means you are dealing with diabetes and because this diabetes is happening at 19 weeks of pregnancy ho sakta hai ki ye patient ko pata hi na ho pre gestational diabetes ka matlab hai she had diabetes before pregnancy is patient ne kabhi bhi test nahi karaya isliye isko pata hi nahi tha ki ye diabetic and for the first time ye jaake डायग्नोज हो रही है ड्यूरिंग प्रेगनेंसी बट शी इज नॉट अ केस ऑफ जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज डायग्नोज होती है बिटवीन 24 फोर टू ट्वेंटी वीक्स राइट जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज के लिए आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ यू नो द डिप्सी क्राइटेरिया हा गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया से इस की जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज को डायग्नोज करने के लिए यू हैव टू डू द टेस्ट एट फर्स्ट एंटीनेटल विजिट एंड बिटवीन 24 टू 28 एट वीक्स इर रिस्पेक्टिव ऑफ प्रीवियस मील्स जब भी आपके पास प्रेग्नेंट फीमेल आएगी एट फर्स्ट एंटीनेटल विजिट और बिटवीन 24 टू 28 एट वीक्स यू आर गोइंग टू गिव हर सेवेंटी फाइव ग्राम ऑफ ग्लूकोज इन थ्री हंड्रेड एम एल ऑफ वॉटर एंड देन आफ्टर टू आवर्स यू आर गोइंग टू चेक हर ब्लड शुगर लेवल्स इफ अ ब्लड शुगर लेवल्स आर लेस देन वन फोर्टी देर इज नो डायबिटीज इफ इट इज बिटवीन वन फोर्टी टू वन नाइनटी नाइन इट इज अ केस ऑफ जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज एंड इफ इट इज मोर देन इक्वल टू टू हंड्रेड इट इज अ केस ऑफ प्री जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज राइट नाउ Coming to the next question, question number fourteen. A twenty-four year old female at thirty-two weeks of pregnancy. That means in third trimester, she is coming to you with BP one sixty by hundred and sixteen. One sixty by hundred and sixteen. का मतलब है she is a case of severe PIH. Right? And your question is saying that her liver enzymes are raised. So there are increased liver enzymes. and she has low platelet count now whenever you have a case of severe pih with increased liver enzymes and low platelet count it means you are dealing with a case of help syndrome राइट अक्यूट फैटी लिवर ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी भी थर्ड ट्राइमेस्टर में प्रेजेंट करता है लेकिन अक्यूट फैटी लिवर ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी में क्वेश्चन इज गोइंग टू से कि उसका के एफ टी अब नॉर्मल है बिकॉज इसमें देर इज लिवर प्लस किडनी फेलियर राइट सो के एफ टी अब नॉर्मल होगा अमोनिया लेवल्स हाई कहेगा एंड क्रिएटनिन लेवल्स हाई कहेगा ग्लूकोस लेवल्स विल बी डिक्रीज so if you get a question jahan pe question mein ammonia levels high diye hain kft abnormal diya hai liver enzymes raised diye hain glucose levels decreased diye hain then it's a case of acute fatty liver of pregnancy cholestasis mein they are going to say bile acids are increased so whenever your question says serum bile acids are increased then that is cholestasis clear to all of you yes what is the management of help syndrome management of help syndrome is immediate termination of pregnancy and because isme severe pih ka complication hota hai help syndrome that is why you have to give magnesium sulfate taki patient ko convulsions na aaye and you have to give anti hypertensive so you have to give her anti hypertensive you have to give her magnesium sulfate so that she doesn't throw any convulsions and you have to go for immediate termination of pregnancy clear which of the following curve or peak is responsible for ovulation so over here we are seeing this is ovulation right and we are seeing that over here now tell me which peak do you think is responsible for ovulation now this peak over here is responsible for ovulation that means peak c is responsible for ovulation which is uh, the hormone which comes in peak c it is lh it is lh surge which is responsible for ovulation please remember ovulation ke liye responsible hota hai lh surge but before ovulation there is both lh and fsh surge that is why you are getting fsh levels also high over here right so before ovulation there is both lh and fsh surge and but the one which is responsible for ovulation is lh surge that is peak c now what do you think is this hormone which is increasing after ovulation which hormone increases after ovulation progesterone so peak d is representing progesterone and which hormone increases before ovulation estrogen so your peak a is estrogen 
clear to all of you next very important question is what is the time difference between lh surge and ovulation best answer is 32 to 36 hours second best answer is 24 to 36 hours right what is the time gap between lh surge and ovulation 32 to 36 hours why does lh surge happen lh surge happens due to increase in estrogen ye increased estrogen ki wajah se lh surge hua now if they ask you what is the time gap between lh surge and ovulation it is 32 to 36 6 hours but if they ask you what is the time gap between lh peak and ovulation it is 10 to 12 hours clear to all of you what is the first sign of ovulation on endometrial biopsy the first sign of ovulation on endometrial biopsy is subnuclear vacuolation clear to all of you Next question, identify the fibroid marked with X. So over here, I have not marked with X. You are just going to tell me what fibroid you are seeing over here. Now, a fibroid which is coming totally inside the uterine cavity is a submucous fibroid. In this case, the fibroid is coming inside the uterine cavity, but it is inside the myometrium also. So this is also a variety of submucous fibroid this fibroid is totally in the peritoneal cavity so this is subserous fibroid and this fibroid is totally inside the myometrium so this is intramural fibroid a fibroid which is totally inside the Myometrium is intramural or interstitial fibroid. Clear to all of you? <coughs> okay. Now, remember a very important thing. Figo has said that there are three types of submucous fibroid. Type 0, type 1 and type 2. Type 0 submucous fibroid is a fibroid which is totally inside the uterine cavity. So this fibroid which was totally inside the uterine cavity was type 0 submucous fibroid. Then type 1 ka matlab hota hai more than 50% fibroid is inside the cavity. Less than 50% is inside myometrium. Type 2 ka matlab hota hai more than 50% is in the myometrium. Less than 50% is in the cavity. So over here if you look at this fibroid. In this fibroid, less than 50% is inside the cavity, more than 50% is inside myometrium. Since more than 50% is inside the myometrium, that is why I am going to call it as a type 2 submucous fibroid. Now, why was this classification begin, given? You just have to remember ki type 0 and type 1 can be removed by hysteroscope. Type 2 cannot be removed by hysteroscope. It cannot be removed hysteroscopically. That is what you have to remember. Type 0, type 1, type 2. Have you understood? Okay. Coming to the next question. Identify the swelling which is seen in 22-year-old female. So this swelling and many times question has been asked on this. This swelling which you are seeing over here is between labia majora and labia minora and it is posterior lateral swelling. Please remember there are three types of cysts just pe questions aa sakte hain. Most common cyst which you get in vagina is inclusion cyst. Now, if you are getting a cyst between labia majora and minora or inside the vestibule and it is posterior lateral. Do you see over here? This swelling over here is on the posterior side and on the lateral side. Posterior lateral agar cyst mil rahi hai, that's a Bartholin cyst. Agar koi bhi cyst anterolaterally mil rahi hai and vagina ki wall mein mil rahi hai, then that's a Gartner's cyst. Please do not get confused between Bartholin cyst and Gartner cyst. Look over here. This blue color cyst is posterior lateral, right? So this will be Bartholin cyst. This red color cyst is anterolateral. 
so this will be gartner's cyst number 1 number 2 do you see this green color marking over here ये जो ग्रीन कलर की सिस्ट है ये ब्लैडर एक के यूरिथ्रा के पास मिल रही है राइट right? सो so, ये जो सिस्ट होती है इसको कहते हैं पैरा यूरिथ्रल सिस्ट राइट सो ओवर हियर दिस ग्रीन कलर इज नियर द यूरिथ्रा सो दिस इज पैरा यूरिथ्रल सिस्ट ये जो सिस्ट है ये पोस्टीरियोलेट्रल है सो दिस इज बार्थोलिन सिस्ट अब गार्टनर सिस्ट कहा मिलेगी गार्टनर सिस्ट मिलेगी एंटीरोलेट्रल एंटीरोलेट्रल होती तो गार्टनर सिस्ट राइट कभी समटाइम्स दे गिव यू अ स्पॉट इमेज एंड दे आस्क यू व्हाट इज इट एंड यू गेट कंफ्यूज बिटवीन गार्टनर सिस्ट एंड सिस्टोसीन सो दिस वेयर इज इमेज ए एंड दिस इज इमेज बी इस इमेज ए में पहले ये बताओ कहां पे मिल रही है सिस्ट क्या ये सिस्ट यूरिथ्रा के पास है नहीं दिस इज नॉट नियर द यूरिथ्रा सो इट कैन नॉट बी अ पैरा यूरिथ्रल सिस्ट कैन यू सी द मार्किंग ऑफ यूरिथ्रा इट इज नॉट नियर द यूरिथ्रा ये जो सिस्ट है ये एंटीरियरली मिल रही है सो so, ये गार्टनर सिस्ट हो सकती है या ये सिस्टोसील हो सकता है जैसे कि यहां पर अब गार्टनर सिस्ट एंड सिस्टोसील में कैसे डिफ्रेंशिएट करोगे गार्टनर सिस्ट स्मूथ होगा सिस्टोसील में ऐसे विजाइना में जैसे रुगोसिटीज मिलती हैं, वैसे सिस्टोसील में भी हमें रुगोसिटीज मिलेंगी डू यू सी दीज रुगोसिटीज हो गई है तो अगर आपको रुगोसिटीज मिल रही हैं, तो इट मीन इट्स अ सिस्टोसील अगर आपको बिल्कुल स्मूथ सिस्ट मिल रही है एंटीरियर वॉल में दैट मीन्स इट इज गार्टनर्स सिस्ट राइट सो लुक ओवर हियर ये जो सिस्ट है ये हमें कहा मिल रही है इन योर क्वेश्चन इन द क्वेश्चन द सिस्ट इज हैपनिंग इन द पोस्टीरोलेट्रल साइड एंड इट इज बिटवीन लेबिया मेजोरा एंड माइनोरा सो दिस इज अ बार्थोलिन सिस्ट क्लियर टू ऑल ऑफ यू okay now just one quick thing about bartholin cyst ka management if you are a marrow subscriber you already know this asymptomatic bartholin cyst which is less than 3 cm it doesn't need any treatment asymptomatic cysts which are more than 3 cm pehle hum kehte the ki bartholin cyst ka management is marsupialization ab nahi hai marsupialization बार्थोलिन सिस्ट अगर वो एसिम्टोमैटिक है उसका मैनेजमेंट है इंसिशन एंड ड्रेनेज बार्थोलिन एप्सिस का भी मैनेजमेंट है इंसिशन एंड ड्रेनेज ओनली इफ योर क्वेश्चन सेज रिकरेंट बार्थोलिन सिस्ट रिकरेंट बार्थोलिन सिस्ट द मैनेजमेंट इज मार्सोपलाइजेशन राइट सो मैनेजमेंट ऑफ बार्थोलिन सिस्ट इज नॉट marsopialization now management of bartholin cyst now is incision and drainage i n d clear okay next question the most effective cervical cost effective cervical cancer screening test is please remember the most cost effective test is via what is via visual inspection with acetic acid विजुअल इंस्पेक्शन विद एसिटिक एसिड जो ये जो हम करते हैं दिस इज डन विद थ्री टू फाइव परसेंट एसिटिक एसिड एंड जब हम एसिटिक एसिड अप्लाई करते हैं तो जो नॉर्मल एरियाज होते हैं वो पिंक रहते हैं एंड जो अब नॉर्मल एरियाज होते हैं इफ यू सी दीज अब नॉर्मल एरियाज अब नॉर्मल एरियाज विल स्टार्ट अपियरिंग व्हाइट इन कलर So, जब भी हम एसिटिक एसिड अप्लाई करते हैं पेशेंट की सर्विक्स पे तो वो एरियाज वे डिस्प्लेजिया इज प्रेजेंट इट विल अपियर व्हाइट इन कलर एंड द एरियाज वे डिस्प्लेजिया इज नॉट प्रेजेंट इट इज गोइंग टू अपियर पिंक इन कलर सो द मोस्ट कॉस्ट इफेक्टिव सर्वाइकल कैंसर स्क्रीनिंग मेथड इज वी आई ए Now, new WHO guidelines. If you are a marrow subscriber, you already know them. Quickly revise with me. According to WHO, the screening for cancer cervix should begin at 30 years. You should stop the screening at 49 years. And the best method for screening is HPV plus VIA. 
if hpv plus via is not given then the second best method is hpv and the third best method is only via right best is hpv plus via wo nahi hai to only hpv wo nahi hai to only via pap smear is not recommended by who for screening of cancer cervix most sensitive method for screening of cancer cervix is hpv dna testing most specific method is pap smear testing who kehta hai ki why pap smear should not be done in developing countries like india is kyunki based on pap smear report we can never do the treatment for cin or for cancer cervix agar hum pap smear karte hain and if anything abnormal report comes then you always have to do colposcopy and biopsy so pap smear should always be followed by colposcopy and biopsy someone is asking me what is meant by marsupialization marsupialization ka matlab hai you are removing the cyst and the side walls are stitched to the surrounding skin right so that a cyst formation doesn't happen again right so remove the cyst and the side walls are stitched to the surrounding skin you don't need to know what is marsupialization you just need to know that the treatment of choice for bartholin cyst these days is ind only for recurrent bartholin cyst we do marsupialization right coming to this very very important so pap smear ke basis pe we never do or based on pap smear we are never going to do management pap smear should always be followed by colposcopy and biopsy right now suppose colposcopy report comes as cin1 what is the management of cin1 management of cin1 is follow up for 2 years and if cin1 persists even after 2 years then you do cryoablation management of cin2 and cin3 is l e e p l l e t z or l e e p l e e p is loop electro excisional procedure l l e t z is large loop excision of transformation zone jab bhi question kahe what is the management of cin2 or cin3 please do not say it is hysterectomy management of cin2 and cin3 is leap or l l etz right up cancer cervix ka management cancer cervix up till stage 2a management is surgery right so for up till stage 2a of can 2a1 of cancer cervix management is surgery isme ek exception hota hai stage 1b3 stage 1b3 mein surgery nahi karte but other than that up till stage 2a1 management is surgery from stage 2a2 onwards 2a2 ke baad chahe wo stage 2b ho chahe wo 3 ho chahe wo 4 ho always management is chemo radiation agar options mein chemo radiation nahi diya hai then you are going to mark the answer as radiotherapy stage 1b3 may be chemo radiation is the answer so very simple you are going to remember cin1 ka management hota hai follow up for 2 years right and 2 years ke baad if it persists cryoablation cin2 and cin3 ka management is leap or lletz cancer cervix ka management bas itna yaad rakho cancer cervix mein up till stage 2a1 surgery karte hain but 1b3 mein surgery nahi karte in stage 1b3 and any stage after 2a2 management is chemo radiation clear to all of you okay now because a question has come in your recent fmg exam that is why i taught you this much detail now which of the following has a false positive bar body first tell me bar body is number of x chromosomes minus 1 right so turner syndrome may there is no bar body right trisomy 21 trisomy 21 mein extra 21 chromosome hota hai it has nothing to do with x or y klein felter syndrome mein there will be one bar body and androgen insensitivity syndrome which is 46xy there will be no bar body 
Now, why are they saying false positive bar body? False positive bar body is liye keh rahe hain because generally jo females hoti hain, unme bar body present hoti hai because females are 46XX and males are 46XY. So, bar body is absent in males. राइट मेल फीमेल कैसे डिसाइड होता है मेल फीमेल डिसाइड होता है बाय प्रेजेंस और एब्सेंस ऑफ वाई क्रोमोसोम वाई क्रोमोसोम प्रेजेंट है तो मेल है वाई क्रोमोसोम एब्सेंट है तो फीमेल है तो टर्नर सिंड्रोम में वाई क्रोमोसोम एब्सेंट होता है दैट इज वाई टर्नर सिंड्रोम आर फीमेल्स लेकिन ये टर्नर सिंड्रोम में फीमेल होने के बाद भी देर इज नो बार बॉडी राइट Whereas Klinefelter syndrome में Y chromosome is present, that means they are males. And in even though they are males, still they have one bar body. That is what is false positive bar body, right? So Klinefelter syndrome has false positive bar body. Klinefelter syndrome in the past three sessions, दो बार पूछा गया है. एक ये question पूछा गया है. फॉल्स पॉजिटिव बार बॉडी एंड अभी एक और क्वेश्चन आएगा ऑन क्लाइन फेल्टर सिंड्रोम सो क्लाइन फेल्टर सिंड्रोम इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन मदर ब्रिंग्स हर 18 ईयर ओल्ड डॉटर टू गाइनी ओपीडी विथ कंप्लेन ऑफ नॉट अटेंड मिनार की राइट हॉर्मोनल स्टडी शोज नॉर्मल एल एच एफ एस एच अब योर क्वेश्चन आई एम जस्ट आस्किंग यू इफ हॉर्मोनल स्टडीज आर शोइंग नॉर्मल एल एच एफ एस एच इसका क्या मतलब हुआ इसका मतलब है कि हाइपोथैलमस नॉर्मल है एंड हाइपोथैलमस जी एन आर एच नॉर्मली रिलीज कर रहा है जिसकी वजह से पिट्यूटरी भी नॉर्मली एफ एस एच एल एच रिलीज कर रहा है सो द मोमेंट योर क्वेश्चन से इज नॉर्मल एल एच एफ एस एच आई नो कि कोई प्रॉब्लम हाइपोथैलमस में नहीं है कोई प्रॉब्लम पिट्यूटरी में नहीं है राइट नाउ योर क्वेश्चन इज सेइंग नॉर्मल ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट एंड प्यूबिक हेयर डेवलपमेंट ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट के लिए द हार्मोन व्हिच इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल इज ईस्ट्रोजन राइट सो इफ नॉर्मल ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट है तो इसका मतलब है कि ओवरी भी नॉर्मल है बिकॉज ओवरी नॉर्मल है दैट इज वाई ईस्ट्रोजन नॉर्मल है दैट इज वाई ब्रेस्ट डेवेलपमेंट इज नॉर्मल right now your question further says ultrasound shows small blind vagina ultrasound is showing small blind vagina and absent uterus karyotype is 46xx karyotype if it is 46xx and there is no uterus what does that mean it is a case of mullerian a genesis in androgen insensitivity syndrome the karyotype is 46xy in turner syndrome karyotype is 46xo and turner syndrome may ovaries are streak ovaries they are not functioning normally and because ovaries don't function normally That is why in Turner syndrome estrogen is less, and that is why breast development is absent. So this cannot be a case of Turner syndrome. This cannot be a case of androgen insensitivity syndrome. It is a case of Mullerian agenesis. Please remember, androgen insensitivity syndrome ki ek baat khas baat hoti hai. Whenever your question says that there is absent uterus. Breast development is present, but pubic hair is less, या scanty. Then it means it is androgen insensitivity syndrome. क्योंकि hormone responsible for pubic hair in females is androgen, right? Breast development के लिए hormone responsible is estrogen. प्यूबिक हेयर के लिए हॉर्मोन रिस्पॉन्सिबल इज एंड्रोजन सो नाउ यू कैन आस्क मी कि मैम ब्रेस्ट क्यों डेवलप होता है एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी सिंड्रोम के पेशेंट्स में बिकॉज द एंड्रोजन गेट कन्वर्टेड इन टू ईस्ट्रोजन एंड दीज इंडिविजुअल्स रिस्पॉन्ड टू ईस्ट्रोजन दे आर इन सेंसिटिव टू एंड्रोजन सो इनके अंदर ब्रेस्ट डेवेलपमेंट होता है लेकिन प्यूबिक हेयर डेवेलपमेंट इज नॉट देयर 
clear next question a 26 year old female attends gynae opd with complaint of secondary amenorrhea she has history of previous dnc and her fsh levels are 6 international units the probable cause of amenorrhea is now iske baad jo mai i am going to tell you you are going to take a screenshot and keep it with you these days they are asking questions based on fsh levels right so i am going to tell you how you are going to approach questions based on fsh levels please remember normal fsh levels are up till 10 international units if your question says that fsh levels are 1 to 2 ya 2 to 3 that means fsh levels are in low normal so agar fsh levels low hain that means problem ya to hypothalamus mein hai ya pituitary mein hai hypothalamus ki problem kya ho sakti hai kalman syndrome kalman syndrome mein you get anosmia so question mein anosmia bhi diya hoga so levels of fsh will be less patient will come to you with amenorrhea and there will be anosmia ab agar pituitary ki problem hai then also levels of fsh will be less pituitary ki problem can be sheehan syndrome in sheehan syndrome patient will complain of failure to lactate to line agar di hai ki amenorrhea hai failure to lactate hai and fsh levels kam hai it means sheehan syndrome or it could be a case of prolactinoma prolactinoma ke case mein they are going to give you headache and visual symptoms so if your question says that there is amenorrhea plus there is fsh levels are low and there is headache and visual symptoms it means prolactinoma there is one more case jisme fsh levels will be low and amenorrhea hoga that is pregnancy pregnancy mein bhi fsh levels less hote hain and you get amenorrhea right why fsh levels are less in pregnancy because in pregnancy the levels of estrogen are high and estrogen has a negative feedback on fsh clear now second case second case ye ho sakta hai ki your question is saying that the levels of fsh are high more than 20 now whenever your question says levels of fsh are high and your patient is having amenorrhea iska matlab problem ovary mein hai why because just now i told you estrogen has a negative feedback on fsh so agar problem ovary mein hogi the levels of estrogen will be less so the negative feedback on fsh will be lost and the levels of fsh will increase so whenever you get a question jisme ye kaha ho ki fsh levels high hai and amenorrhea hai to problem is in the ovaries right to primary amenorrhea mein problem ovary mein kya ho sakti hai turner syndrome secondary amenorrhea ka case hai to kya problem ho sakti hai premature menopause right now if your question comes ki fsh levels normal hai and your patient is having amenorrhea so number 1 you have to think ki problem uterus mein hai right so problem is in the uterus problem na to hypothalamus mein hai na pituitary mein hai na ovary mein hai so uterus ki problem which leads to secondary amenorrhea is asherman syndrome uterus ki problem which leads to primary amenorrhea is mullerian agenesis and androgen insensitivity syndrome mullerian agenesis mein 46 xx diya hoga androgen insensitivity mein 46 xy diya hoga another reason which can lead to fsh normal and amenorrhea is pcos please remember pcos ke patients mein fsh levels are normal lh levels are high and they can present to you as a case of amenorrhea so if you remember this chart 
इस चार्ट का आई वॉन्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू टेक अ स्क्रीन शॉट इफ यू रिमेंबर दिस योर क्वेश्चन ऑन ए मेनोरिया विल नेवर नेवर बी रॉन्ग राइट कैन यू पीपल हियर मी okay now so in this case they are saying fsh levels are six international units that means fsh levels are normal normal fsh levels kis mein milte hain that means problem kis mein hai uterus mein hai and patient are as secondary amenorrhea ke sath so that means she is a case of asher man syndrome राइट शी हैंड सिंड्रोम में एफ एस एच लेवल हमें डिक्रीज मिलते प्रेगनेंसी में एफ एस एच लेवल हमें डिक्रीज मिलते प्री मेच्योर ओवेरियन फेलियर दैट इज प्री मेच्योर मेनोपॉज में एफ एस एच लेवल इंक्रीज मिलते क्लियर नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन A 16-year-old female visits gynae OPD with complaint of cyclical pain in abdomen and no menarche. On examination, breast development is normal, pubic hair is normal. Local examination shows bulging bluish hymen, and on per rectal examination, uterus is present. So, जैसे ही question ये कहे कि patient cyclical pain in abdomen के साथ आया है, and there is a bulging bluish hymen. That means we are dealing with imperforate hymen, and management of imperforate hymen is you have to give a cruciate incision on the hymen. Next question. a 55 year old post menopausal female attends obgy clinic and she has history of chronic pelvic pain x ray shows the following ab x ray mein hame kya dikh raha hai calcification dikh raha hai and a huge calcification is seen right you have to tell me whether it is ovarian mass pid calcified fibroid or bladder stone please remember कि ओवेरियन मास जिसमें कैल्सिफिकेशन मिलता है दैट इज अ डरमोइड सिस्ट डरमोइड सिस्ट में यू कैन गेट कैल्सिफिकेशन बट डरमोइड सिस्ट इज सीन इन यंग फीमेल्स यहां पे हमें एज दिया है 55 ईयर ओल्ड पोस्ट मेनोपॉजल फीमेल राइट एंड डरमोइड सिस्ट में जनरली यू गेट अ कैल्सिफाइड टूथ या हमें रॉकेटैंस की प्रोट्यूबरेंस मिलेगा कैल्सिफाइड यू विल नॉट गेट अ बिग कैल्सिफिकेशन लाइक दिस राइट सो डम ओवेरियन मास रूल्ड आउट ब्लैडर स्टोन पेशेंट इज नॉट कमिंग टू यू विद एनी यूरिनरी सिम्टम्स इतना बड़ा ब्लैडर स्टोन विदाउट यूरिनरी सिम्टम्स हो इट इज नॉट पॉसिबल एंड ब्लैडर स्टोन विल बी सेंट्रली रोकेटेड this mass which you are seeing is eccentrically located so this is most probably a calcified fibroid right now fibroid mein jab bhi calcification hota hai that is it gives the appearance of a popcorn calcification so over here you are getting a popcorn calcification like picture and the most common fibroid which leads to popcorn calcification is subserosal fibroid right next question a female after delivery complains of cramps during breastfeeding which hormone is responsible for it please remember that for milk production the hormone which is responsible is prolactin and for milk ejection the hormone which is responsible is oxytocin oxytocin also leads to uterine contractions that is why whenever there are cramps which are felt during breastfeeding it is due to the hormone oxytocin because oxytocin is leading to uterine contractions as well right next question a 25 year old female and a husband present to infertility clinic semen analysis is normal but hsg shows distal dilatation of the tube on taking proper history female complains of menorrhagia the most likely cause of infertility is now this is how distal dilatation appears right Now remember that distal dilatation अगर हमें मिल रहा है that means the fimbrial end of the tube is blocked and ये fimbrial end can be blocked in case of TB and in case of salpingitis which salpingitis gonorrhea 
राइट सो गोनोरिया की वजह से हमको डिस्टल एंड का ब्लॉकेज मिल सकता है नाउ वेन एवर यू आर गेटिंग प्रोक्सिमल ब्लॉक ये देख रहे हो दिस इज प्रोक्सिमल ब्लॉक डाई यहां से आगे जा ही नहीं रही है सो दिस इज वॉट इज कॉल्ड एज कॉर्नुअल ब्लॉक और प्रोक्सिमल ब्लॉक मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ अ कॉर्नुअल ब्लॉक और प्रोक्सिमल ब्लॉक इज फिजियोलॉजिकल स्पैज ट्यूब में स्पैज हो जाता है दैट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन सो इफ दे शो यू दिस एच एस जी डे आफ्टर टूमोरो एंड दे आस्क यू वॉट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज प्लीज डू नॉट से टीबी मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज इज फिजियोलॉजिकल ब्लॉक राइट बट विच पैथोलॉजी लीड्स टू कॉर्नवल ब्लॉक टीबी इसका मतलब टीबी से प्रोक्सिमल ब्लॉक भी हो सकता है टीबी से डिस्टल ब्लॉक भी हो सकता है generally tb se proximal block hota hai but then distal block can also happen with tb so now how am i going to decide whether she is a case of genital tuberculosis or whether she is a case of salpingitis spasm ki wajah se cornual block milta right now comes this that the female gives complaints of menorrhagia टीबी के पेशेंट में जो मोस्ट कॉमन कंप्लेन मिलती है दैट इज ए मेनोरिया अ पेशेंट ऑफ टीबी इज गोइंग टू कम टू यू विद ए मेनोरिया राइट मेनोरेजिया की कंप्लेन मिलती है सैल्पिन में सो ओवर हियर आंसर इज गोइंग टू बी सैल्पिन जाइटिस वाई इट इज नॉट अ पॉलिप क्यू बिकॉज इफ दिस वुड हैव बीन पॉलिप और जब हम डाय पास करते तो हमें एक फिलिंग डिफेक्ट मिलता राइट right? सो so, क्योंकि क्वेश्चन इज नॉट सेइंग अबाउट फिलिंग डिफेक्ट दैट इज व्हाई इट इज नॉट अ पॉलिप राइट नाउ विच डाई इज यूज फॉर एच एस जी ये क्वेश्चन आया हुआ है एंड द डाई विच इज यूज फॉर एच एस जी इज मिथिलीन ब्लू सॉरी यूरोग्राफिन यूरोग्राफिन इज द डाई विच इज यूज फॉर एच Next, a 55. This is the question which I was talking about. A 55-year-old female is found to have cervical cancer stage 3B. What is the management? Now you tell me. 3B. मतलब this is stage 3. And I told you 2A2 के beyond, 2A2 plus इसके beyond हम हमेशा chemo radiation करते हैं. Right? So your answer is concurrent chemo radiation. clear to all of you so whenever it is stage 2a2 and beyond that you always do chemo radiation that is something which i told you just now so your answer is going to be chemo radiation clear that completes your fmge june 2021 paper coming to december 2021 paper according to mtp act 2021 guidelines mtp can be done up till how many weeks so up till how many weeks can you do mtp mtp can now be done up till 24 weeks but if pregnancy is due to contraceptive failure then you can do it still only up till 20 weeks right and in case of severe fetal anomalies there is no upper limit three things you have to remember अब हम एम कर सकते हैं अप टू 24 वीक्स बट अगर कॉन्ट्रासेप्टिव फेलियर की वजह से है तो स्टिल अप टू 20 वीक्स एंड इन केस ऑफ सिवियर कंजेनिटल अनोमली देर इज नो अपर लिमिट नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन अ जी थ्री पी टू लेडी प्रेजेंट्स एट एट वीक्स ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी फॉर एम टीपी एट वीक्स ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी में जस्ट नाउ आई टोल्ड यू की अपटिल सेवन वीक्स हम क्या करेंगे मेडिकल अबॉर्शन सेवन टू ट्वेल्व वीक्स में हम क्या करेंगे सक्शन इवैक्युएशन सक्शन इवैक्युएशन कैसे करते हैं आई टोल्ड यू सक्शन इवैक्युएशन के लिए यू आर यूजिंग अ कार्मन स्कैनुला दिस इज हाउ अ कार्मन स्कैनुला अपियर्स लाइक एंड दिस हैज टू बी अटैच टू अ सक्शन मशीन राइट सो द नंबर ऑन कार्बन स्कैनुला इट कॉरेस्पॉन्ड्स टू द डाया मीटर ऑफ द कैनुला इन मिली मीटर्स एंड द साइज ऑफ द कैनुला इज इक्वल टू द ड्यूरेशन ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी इन वीक्स जितने वीक्स की प्रेगनेंसी है उतना साइज कार्बन स्कैनुला यू आर गोइंग टू यूज राइट सो इफ दिस इज एट वीक्स प्रेगनेंसी आई एम गोइंग टू यूज एट नंबर कैनुला नाउ सपोज इन योर ऑप्शन यू आर गिवेन फाइव सेवन 9 and 
and patient is eight weeks pregnant. Now, what are you going to mark the answer as? So, the best answer is that the number on the cannula should correspond to the weeks of gestation. But if option mein ye nahi diya hai, then you have to choose one less. That means if it is eight weeks, you are going to choose seven number cannula. You are not going to choose nine number cannula, right? So, either it has to correspond to the gestation or one less. Clear? Okay. So, everything about uh, manual vacuum aspiration and menstrual regulation, I've already told you. Now, next question. A patient presents with 45 days of amenorrhea. She wants abortion. If you are a treating doctor, what would you prefer? 45 days of amenorrhea ka matlab hai that she is 6 weeks pregnant, right? And up till 7 weeks. That means up till 49 days, we go for medical abortion. So in India, medical abortion is done up till 7 weeks. WHO says that medical abortion can be done up till 9 weeks, right? Now, when you are doing medical abortion up till 7 weeks, it is done as an OPD procedure. But when you are doing it between 7 to 9 weeks, you have to admit the patient and then do it. What is the protocol? On day 1, you are going to give 200 milligrams of oral mifepristone. And then on day 3, you are going to give mesoprost. How much mesoprost? 400 micrograms of mesoprost right it has to be given on day three then in case you are doing abortion between seven to nine weeks so day one same reta hai. you have to give 200 milligrams of mifepristone but now the mesoprost which you have to give is 800 micrograms right so up till seven weeks hum 400 micrograms dete hai. after that hum 800 micrograms dete hai. and then after two weeks, we call the patient for follow-up to see whether the product, which, uh, whether the process of abortion is complete or not, right? So now, over here, 45 days pay patient has come to you. So you are going to give 200 milligrams of mifepristone and 400 micrograms of mesoprost after 48 hours. Clear to all of you? Yes? Right, Pushpa, if in questions they don't mention the gestational age, then they are going to give you 800 micrograms of mesoprost, mark it as 800 because 400 to 800 ke beech mein hum kuch bhi de sakte hain. Right, so if even if the gestation age is not given and they have given 800 micrograms of mesoprost, mark the answer as 800 micrograms of mesoprost. Right, okay. Maximum amount of amniotic fluid is seen as. Please remember, maximum amount of amniotic fluid kab dekhne ko milta hai? 34 weeks pe. And range kya hoti hai? 32 to 34 weeks. Right? So, maximum amount is at 34 weeks. Range is 32 to 34 weeks. So, in your question which came, you are going to mark the answer as 32 weeks here. Clear? Now, uh, at... So, this is, a, you know, a very theoretical type of a thing. Ki 32 to 34 weeks ke beech mein amount is 1 liter. 36 weeks pe 900 ml. At term, it is 800 ml. And after that, jaise jaise pregnancy badegi, vaise vaise the amount amniotic fluid will decrease. So, at 42 weeks, it is 200 ml. Nothing to mug up here. You just need to remember when is the amniotic fluid maximum? 34 weeks. Range is 32 to 34 weeks. Identify the ultrasound which is given in the uterus, uh, which uh, ultrasound of the uterus, what is what is being shown over here, you are seeing snowstorm appearance and snowstorm appearance, if you are getting on ultrasound, that means this is a case of complete mole. What is the other name for complete mole? The other name for complete mole is vesicular mole or high dt form mole. In case of complete mole, you get a snowstorm appearance, which is also called as honeycomb appearance. What is the uh, karyotype for a complete mole, the karyotype for a complete mole is 46XX. That's the most common karyotype. 
कंप्लीट मोल इज डिप्लॉइड प्लीज रिमेंबर कंप्लीट मोल में देर इज एन एम टी ओवा विच इज बींग फर्टिलाइज बाय अ स्पर्म एंड देन द क्रोमोजोम नंबर ऑफ द स्पर्म डुप्लीकेट्स सो दे आर डिप्लॉइड मोस्ट कॉमन क्रोमोजोम नंबर इज फोर्टी सिक्स एक्स एक्स एंड in case of complete mole you don't see any fetal part whereas partial mole mein jo karyotype hota hai they are triploid and you get 69 xxy that is the most common chromosome number partial mole mein some part of the fetus will be seen on ultrasound and that is why it resembles incomplete abortion so if you are getting a snowstorm appearance on uh, ultrasound that means you are dealing with a complete mole or which is also called as vesicular mole if you are getting snowstorm appearance on chest x ray that means it is a chorio carcinoma which has metastasized to the lungs if they ask you what is the most common appearance of a chorio carcinoma on chest x ray then that is not snowstorm appearance most common appearance is cannon ball appearance in which stage of chorio carcinoma you get lung metastasis in stage 3 you get lung metastasis clear clear to all of you so this is a case of hydatiform mole hydatiform mole ka matlab hi hota hai complete mole or vesicular mole right okay then which of the following is an indication for surgical management of ectopic pregnancy so remember ectopic pregnancy jab bhi hamare paas ruptured ectopic pregnancy hoti hai ruptured ectopic pregnancy mein you always have to do surgical management right and the surgery which you have to do in ruptured ectopic is salpingectomy whether the family of the patient is complete or not ek hi surgery karte hain if there is ruptured ectopic and that is salpingectomy you have to remove the ruptured tube now in case of unruptured ectopic you have the option of doing medical management or you can go for surgical management now unrup medical management we do it in unruptured ectopic you never do medical management in ruptured ectopic and you the how do i come to know it is unruptured because vitals of the patient will be stable so only if vitals of the patient are stable if free fluid is less than 100 cc then i am going to do medical management right this is an absolute requirement ki patient ke vitals should be stable it should be a case of unruptured ectopic and the free fluid should be less than 100 cc other than that hcg value should be less than 5000 size of the ectopic should be less than 4 cm cardiac activity should be absent and there should be absent or minimal pain these are requirements relative requirements for medical management now suppose your question says cardiac activity present hai cardiac activity present hai to it doesn't mean ki a medical management is contraindicated but medical management is not preferred if cardiac activity is present right we don't prefer medical management we prefer surgical management if cardiac activity is present clear to all of you yes beta hcg less than 5000 clear what you are saying beta hcg less than 1000 that's not right beta hcg less than 5000 now which of the following is an indication for surgical management size of the ectopic more than 4 cm so if size of the ectopic is more than 4 cm i prefer surgical management less than 4 cm hota hai then i go for medical management beta hcg less than 1000 ab beta hcg less than 1000 hai to obviously medical management patient wants to continue pregnancy this is a, a very faltu ka option which they have given unruptured ectopic mein medical management so the answer over here is option a if size of the ectopic is more than 4 cm then you have to go for surgical management so i am repeating someone asked me to repeat just quickly i am telling you medical management ki requirements kya hoti hai it is done in case of unruptured ectopic number 1 
it is done only if vitals of your patient are stable it is done only if free fluid is less than 100 cc these are three absolute requirements for medical management ab iske alawa hcg levels should be less than 5000 size of the ectopic should be less than 4 cm cardiac activity should be absent and there should be no pain now as far as cardiac activity is concerned cardiac activity is a relative requirement agar cardiac activity present hai and your patient says that i want to get a medical management done you may do a medical management lekin hum prefer surgical karte hain why hum medical prefer nahi karte because of the chances of failure of medical management if cardiac activity is present there are high chances of failure of medical management so this is the criteria or absolute requirement for Me, uh, medical management these are relative requirements for medical management ruptured ectopic may always and always surgery has to be done right cardiac output returns to normal by so remember after delivery cardiac output returns to normal by 10 days after delivery right another very important thing which you have to remember is when is cardiac output maximum so ma cardiac output is maximum immediately after delivery right so the chances of heart failure are maximum immediately after delivery then in the second stage of labor then in late first stage of labor and then between 28 to 32 weeks of pregnancy right so maximum cardiac output is immediately after delivery then second stage of labor then late first stage of labor and then between 28 to 32 weeks right cardiac output returns to normal by 10 days after delivery blood volume returns to normal by 1 week after delivery clear absolute contraindication to breastfeeding please remember there is only one infection जो कि एब्सोल्यूट कॉन्ट्राइंडिकेशन होता है टू ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग एंड दैट इज हर्पीज सिंप्लेक्स इन्फेक्शन एंड दैट टू इफ इट इज प्रेजेंट ऑन द ब्रेस्ट एरिया दैट इज एन एब्सोल्यूट कॉन्ट्राइंडिकेशन टू ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग इसके अलावा कोई भी इन्फेक्शन इज नॉट एन एब्सोल्यूट कॉन्ट्राइंडिकेशन टू ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग right absolute contraindication to breast feedings are if the female is iv drug abuser or if she uses excessive alcohol if she is on anti cancer drugs if she has herpes simplex infection on the breast if the baby has lactose intolerance or baby has galactosemia right as far as untreated pulmonary tuberculosis is concerned and as far as hiv is concerned the in developing countries they are not a contraindication right and iske alawa to koi bhi infection is not a contraindication whether it is developing country whether it is developed country hepatitis c hepatitis b hpv covid torch test none of them is a, a, a contraindication to breastfeeding right developed countries may pulmonary tuberculosis untreated and hiv is a contraindication but developing countries may wo bhi contraindication nahi hai that's not a contraindication right if the patient is on warfarin that's not a contraindication right warfarin is very safe during lactation so over here the answer is galactosemia clear to all of you then hormone responsible for pain during breastfeeding just now we did it is oxytocin how much is the recommended dose of folic acid in pregnancy with previous history of neural tube defect so all of you know that if there is previous history of neural tube defect you have to give 4 mg of folic acid otherwise it is 400 micrograms normally in all females the dose of folic acid which you have to give to prevent neural tube defects is 400 micrograms but if there is previous history you have to give 4 mg if a female is on anti epileptic drugs then also the dose which you have to give is 4 mg then if a patient is diabetic right then the dose which you have to give is 400 micrograms don't say it is 4 milligrams right diabetic patients may be the dose of folic acid is 400 micrograms what is the dose of folic acid in red pill 
right so jo red pill government of india deti hai to prevent anemia what is the dose of folic acid 500 micrograms clear to all of you yes till how long do you have to give folic acid folic acid should be started one month before pregnancy and it should be continued for 3 months after pregnancy from fourth month onwards we will give red pill and ye jo red pill hota hai isme kitna iron hota hai it has got 60 mg of iron and 500 micrograms of folic acid right and it should be continued throughout pregnancy and 180 days after delivery clear okay next question minimum number of antenatal visits as recommended by who who ki new recommendations are eight antenatal visits according to government of india there are four antenatal visits right then uh, which of the following is the safest drug to be used for pregnancy induced hypertension the safest drug which can be used for pregnancy induced hypertension is methyl dopa please remember that now they say there is no drug of choice for pih now they say pih ke liye there are three first line drugs what are the first line drugs for pih the first line drugs for pih are number 1 labitalol number 2 hydralazine and number 3 nitro um, nifedipine so labitalol hydralazine and nifedipine they are first line drugs for treating severe pih please remember these anti hypertensives you are going to use only in severe pih that means once bp is more than 160 by 110 then only you have to use anti hypertensives right for mild pih anti hypertensives role is not there you do not use anti hypertensives for mild pih ih clear to all of you okay what are the anti hypertensives which are contraindicated in pregnancy so ace inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers disoxide diuretics and beta blockers these are anti hypertensives which are contraindicated in pregnancy diuretic is contraindicated as an anti hypertensive but if your pregnant female has heart disease with that is heart failure if your pregnant female gets heart failure then you can use diuretic as anti hypertensive it is contraindicated right why answer is not hydralazine see hydralazine is not the answer answer is methyl dopa that is what we have i mean that's how the studies have shown methyl dopa is one of the safest drug to be used in pregnancy as anti hypertensive right okay then a patient presents with positive urine pregnancy test in which of the following conditions you will have to assess the pregnancy test repeatedly so rather than saying hcg levels repeatedly they are saying pregnancy test repeatedly so all of you know that if it is a case of molar pregnancy molar pregnancy may after evacuation you have to do hcg levels up till 6 months you have to monitor her hcg levels up till 6 months right so in which condition you have to assess her pregnancy test repeatedly you have to do it repeatedly in molar pregnancy how do you follow up a patient with rh incompatibility rh incompatibility ke patient mein hum indirect comb test karte hain and agar indirect comb test if it comes out to be positive then you follow it up with peak systolic velocity of middle cerebral artery i'm just writing it here you follow it up with middle cerebral artery doppler and in middle cerebral artery doppler you are going to look at peak systolic velocity right so how do you follow up a patient of rh incompatibility rh incompatibility ke patient mein you don't do hcg levels you do indirect comb test and if indirect comb test comes out to be positive you go for middle cerebral artery doppler now you are asking ma'am drugs for mild ph for mild pih we do not use any hypertensives if they ask you what is the management of mild pih 
प्लीज रिमेंबर इवन वेदर इट इज माइल्ड और वेदर इट इज सिवियर इनिशियली हम सारे पेशेंट्स को एडमिट करते हैं सो दैट आई कैन रूल आउट सिवियर पी आई एच वंस आई हैव रूल्ड आउट सिवियर पी आई एच आई विल डिस्चार्ज दैम राइट यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू गिव एनी एंटी हाइपरटेंसिव नो मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट right in patients ko you are not going to give any hypertensive anti hypertensives you are not going to give them any magnesium sulfate you are going to check their bp you are going to check their liver function test and their platelet count all these things will be checked and you are going to deliver them at 37 weeks that is all what you do in mild pih no anti hypertensive no magnesium sulfate initially you will admit them यू विल सी कि कहीं इनके अंदर एक्चुअली में एक पेशेंट सिवियर पीआईएच का तो नहीं है वंस यू आर श्योर दैट दे बिलोंग टू माइल्ड पीआईएच यू आर गोइंग टू डिस्चार्ज देम एंड यू आर गोइंग टू टेल देम टू रेगुलरली कम टू यू एंड टू गेट देर बीपी मॉनिटर्ड इन देयर होम्स एज वेल एंड यू आर गोइंग टू डिलीवर देम एट थर्टी सेवन वीक्स राइट ओके नाउ फॉर प्रीवियस न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट सी फॉर प्री uh when i was telling you folic acid over here please remember that folic acid if you are beginning in a fee, into all pregnant females you begin them one month before conception but in females in whom there is previous history of neural tube defect you begin it 3 months before conception but we are not astrologers imagine kya aap kisi bhi patient ko bata sakte ho ki 3 months from now you are going to become pregnant no you cannot tell so although textbook say 3 month before conception ideally the answer is as soon as a female with previous history of neural tube defect thinks about conceiving you should put her on 4 mg of folic acid right and in both these cases you are going to continue the folic acid up till 3 months after delivery clear okay next next question was most common neonatal complication of gestational diabetes right now please remember that in a case of diabetes mother is going to have hyperglycemia same blood goes to the fetus so fetus also has hyperglycemia now because of hyperglycemia in the fetus fetal pancreas will produce insulin so there will be hyperinsulinemia and because of this hyperinsulinemia in the fetus there is going to be macrosomia right now once the baby is born the connection between mother and baby is no longer there so hyperglycemia ka source nahi raha glucose ka there is no source what remains in the baby is hyperinsulinemia because of which there will be hypoglycemia hypokalemia hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia hyperviscosity syndrome that is polycythemia and hyperbilirubinemia all these babies they can they can be, there are very high chances of respiratory distress syndrome because insulin decreases surfactant synthesis there are increased chances of necrotizing enterocolitis right now the complications which are never seen in babies of diabetic mother so in babies of diabetic mother you will never have hyperglycemia you will never have anemia they have polycythemia they never have anemia and mental retardation right so most common complication of gestational diabetes is hyperglycemia a neonatal complication no congenital malformation kabhi bhi gestational diabetes ke babies mein milta hai no congenital malformation is seen in pre gestational diabetes so remember the most common neonatal complication of gestational diabetes is hypoglycemia right clear to all of you next question a 26 year old primary gravida has come to you at 12 weeks pregnancy she has lower quadrant pain and fever her ultrasound shows appendix which is 10 mm thick and her wbc count is 18000 
which of the following is done so clear cut case hai appendicitis in pregnancy ka patient has come to you with lower quadrant pain she has fever and on ultrasound you are getting a 10 mm thick appendix right and whenever there is appendicitis in pregnancy what are you going to do in question number 26 first paper why is answer not d i'll have to go to question number 26 just let me see what is the confusion which has occurred with you people if you are going to message me so late how am i going to know what question you are talking about okay why is answer not d please remember that in case of cancer cervix after stage 2a2 from stage 2a2 onwards you have to do chemo radiation there is no role of surgery so aap ye nahi kahoge surgery followed by chemo radiation no right your answer is only chemo radiation no surgery clear surgery is done only up till stage 2a1 clear to all of you now coming to my question which was yeah appendicitis in pregnancy so whenever there is appendicitis in pregnancy management is immediate appendicectomy plus antibiotics and you know tocolytics just in case patient has gone into preterm labor right so i am going to give her antibiotics and immediate surgery so appendicitis in pregnancy means you have to go for immediate appendicectomy age doesn't count anywhere beta for management of cancers age is not counting which of the following can cause cervical cancer all of you know that hpv 16 and hpv 18 are the ones which lead to cancer cervix most common hpv causing cancer cervix is 16 most specific is 18 most common hpv causing squamous cell cancer is 16 most common causing adenocarcinoma is 18 HPV 6 and 11 they are responsible for genital warts and laryngeal papillomatosis please remember HPV ke bare mein they also ask which protein of HPV is used for making HPV vaccines so L1 capsid protein is used for making HPV vaccine HPV vaccines is very important India mein recently bana hai Sarvavac Sarvavac is the first quadrivalent vaccine which has been made in India right now please remember that HPV vaccines till now we were saying that HPV vaccines are given between age group 9 to 26 recently HPV vaccines have also been approved for years 26 to 45 so high risk females may between 26 to 45 years also we can give HPV vaccines right ideal age for giving HPV vaccines is 11 to 12 years now filter which is used in colposcopy as i told you colposcopy you have to do if pap smear result comes out to be no abnormal then it has to be followed by colposcopy and colposcopy karte karte hum biopsy lete hain and the filter which is used in colposcopy is a green filter with the help of this green filter you will visualize abnormal blood vessels so if you are a marrow subscriber you know the procedure for colposcopy right next question management of decubitus ulcer in a uterine prolapse so why is there decubitus ulcer in a uterine prolapse this decubitus ulcer is due to venous congestion and how do you manage it you manage it by doing packing ye packing what is what is the what are the things which you are using for packing you are using acriflavin glycerin acriflavin plus glycerin acriflavin is an antiseptic agent and glycerin is a hygroscopic agent right next question 
a multiparous female complains of dribbling of urine during coughing and laughing that means whenever intra abdominal pressure is increased she is having dribbling of urine and this is what you get in case of stress incontinence now in case of stress incontinence the best management is birsh kolpo suspension that is the best surgery right but the most commonly done surgery is tot tot stands for tension free trans obturator tape tension free trans obturator tape if tot is not given in the options you are going to mark the answer as tvt tvt is tension free trans vaginal tape right now why it is not visico vaginal fistula visico vaginal fistula ke case mein patient will complain of continuously dribbling of urine patient will say she has continuous dribbling of urine so it is not related to laughing it is not related to coughing there is continuous dribbling of urine plus there is no normal urination no normal urination right jabki yahan pe patient is having dribbling only while coughing and laughing and there is normal urination also which is present right then a female presents with grayish white discharge clu cells and positive whiff test now whenever there is grayish white discharge glu clu cells and positive whiff test that means they are talking about bacterial vaginosis right now in case of bacterial vaginosis the drug of choice is metronidazole bacterial vaginosis is not sexually transmitted so no partner treatment is needed and if the patient is pregnant then also the drug of choice is metronidazole or clindamycin right so over here the drug of choice is metronidazole please remember that if in case of bacterial vaginosis you have a foul smelling discharge and there is no pruritus now how do you distinguish bacterial vaginosis discharge from leucorrhea in leucorrhea also the discharge is white here also the discharge is grayish white right in leucorrhea also there is no pruritus there is no itching but the difference is in leucorrhea there will be no foul smell right whereas in bacterial vaginosis you are going to get foul smell right in case of trichomonas your question will say that patient has a frothy yellowish green discharge pruritus is present dysuria is present you get a strawberry vagina whiff test can be present or it may be absent clu cells are present right and it is uh, sorry clu cells are absent sorry i'm so sorry clu cells are absent it is a sexually transmitted disease so whenever you are getting a frothy yellowish discharge with pruritus present whiff test may be present and you are getting a strawberry vagina that means it is trichomonas which is sexually transmitted disease drug of choice for trichomonas is also metronidazole in trichomonas partner treatment is needed and in pregnancy the drug which you give is metronidazole in case of candida the main complaint of the patient is pruritus discharge bahut scanty hota hai right and it is cottage cheese like discharge you never get foul smelling discharge ph of the discharge is less than 4.5 that's very very important ek hi condition hai jisme ph of the discharge is less than 4.5 and that is candida right now in case of candida the drug of choice is oral fluconazole in non pregnant females in pregnant females it is topical clotrimazole in case of candida partner treatment is given only if the partner has symptoms if the partner is symptomatic then you give treatment now for syndromic management of vaginal discharge we use kit number 2 which is green kit it has got fluconazole and instead of metronidazole it has got secnidazole clear to all of you 
intense itching will be seen in case of candida because as i told you in candida the main complaint of the patient is pruritus right next question a young girl who has not attained menarche complains of cyclical pain in abdomen her breast development was normal local examination of the genital area showed the following image so this image was given what are you seeing over here you are seeing that there is imperforate hymen you are seeing a bulging hymen a tensed hymen and that is why this is a case of imperforate hymen right okay next question a patient is taking treatment for infertility and was given an ovulation trigger the ultrasound of the pelvis shows some ascites and image is given below the probable diagnosis is now in this question what you are seeing in this question you are seeing that you are getting big big follicles inside the ovary number 1 number 2 they are saying that patient was taking some treatment for infertility and now once the ovulation trigger was given she had big big follicles inside the ovary now i am confused it can be a case of pcos or it can be a case of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome please remember for pcos the diagnostic criteria is rotterdam criteria Rotterdam criteria says that out of the following three, any two should be present. What are the three? Number one, increase androgens, clinically or biochemically, ovulatory dysfunction, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, and polycystic morphology on ultrasound. Polycystic morphology on ultrasound का मतलब है more than equal to 12 follicles, 2 to 9 millimeters in size. राइट right? लेकिन अब नया क्राइटेरिया आ गया विच सेज मोर देन इक्वल टू ट्वेंटी फॉलिकल्स टू टू नाइन मिलीमीटर्स इन साइज सो अर्लियर दे यूज टू से पीसीओएस की डायग्नोसिस के लिए यू नीड मोर देन इक्वल टू ट्वेल्व फॉलिकल्स नाउ दे सेम मोर देन इक्वल टू ट्वेंटी फॉलिकल्स टू टू नाइन मिलीमीटर्स इन साइज अब यहां पे हमें जो फॉलिकल्स मिल रहे हैं दे आर मच बिगर right so whenever you are getting much bigger follicles which are more than 1 cm in size uh, it means it is a case of ohss ohss is an iatrogenic complication राइट right? ये कभी हमेशा ड्रग से होती है कभी नॉर्मली नहीं होती एंड व्हिच इज द मोस्ट कॉमन ड्रग व्हिच लीड्स टू ohss hmg Human menopausal gonadotropin followed by clomiphene citrate. Most common drug which leads to OHSS is HMG, right? So, is me. बहुत बड़े follicles मिलते हैं because you have overstimulated the ovary. ये जो HMG होता है, it has LH and FSH. तो इसमें जो FSH होता है, that leads to growth of the follicles and that is why you get big, big follicles. That is the difference between PCOS and OHSS. PCOS में you get small follicles, right? In OHSS you get big follicles. Clear? Which of the following is an absolute contraindication for IUCD? So remember the contra absolute contraindications for IUCD, whether it is copper IUCD or whether it is Mirena, there are four of them. Number one, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Number two, distorted uterine cavity. This distorted uterine cavity could be seen in cancer cervix, cancer endometrium, or in congenital malformations. Then, if your patient has current PID. right or if patient has pregnancy now these are the contraindications for both copper iucd and mirena iske alawa a contraindication hai only for copper iucd which is wilson's disease and one contraindication only for mirena that is if there is history of breast cancer right so over here previous history of ectopic pregnancy is not a contraindication previous history of pid is not a contraindication current pid is a contraindication hiv positive female is not a contraindication undiagnosed vaginal bleeding is a contraindication 
false statement regarding non scalpel vasectomy now even if you don't know many details about non scalpel vasectomy you know this that sterility is not immediately attained after vasectomy right after vasectomy sterility is attained after 3 months so sterility is attained after 3 months or after 20 ejaculates so once i have done vasectomy i advise the couple to use a barrier contraceptive and then after 20 ejaculates we will do two semen analysis and if both the semen analysis say that the patient is azoospermic then we tell them to stop using the barrier method right now over here they are saying hematoma formation may occur yes it may occur recanalization is possible yes it is possible sexual function following healing is rarely affected and that is true sexual function is rarely affected but remember although recanalization possible hota hai after vasectomy still vasectomy is taken as a permanent method of contraception whether it is tubectomy or whether it is vasectomy you are not going to say that they are reversible methods they are not reversible methods they are permanent methods right never say they are reversible methods another very important question is what are lark methods lark methods are long act acting reversible methods so what are long acting reversible contraceptives in long acting reversible contraceptives only three contraceptives comes injections implants and iucd right so these are long acting reversible method lark method the answer to this question was option b so they had asked false statement so which is the false statement sterility is immediately attained after vasectomy that's a wrong statement it is attained after 3 months clear okay next question acha let's look at these instruments these are two instruments which are used for vasectomy this is a dissecting forceps and this is a ringed clamp these are two instruments which are used for doing vasectomy so it is a non scalpel vasectomy where we don't use any scalpel we are using a dissecting forceps and a ringed clamp why is this called as a forceps and not as a scissors because scissors may kabhi bhi ye nahi milta ye jo lock hai ye nahi milta lock is seen only in forceps lock is never seen in scissors so this image c is a scissor whereas image a is a dissecting forceps so these are two instruments which are used in non scalpel vasectomy next question a lady with infertility undergoes laparoscopy for assessment of her fallopian tubes chromotubation was done and a dye was passed the dye used for performing chromotubation so please remember that investigation of choice for tubal patency is hsg right hsg ke liye jo aap instrument use karte ho this is a funnel shaped instrument jisko kehte hain leech wilkinson cannula hsg mein the dye which is used is urographin and the time for doing hsg is between day 7 to day 10 that is in the first half of the cycle right between day 7 to day 10 what are contraindications for hsg hsg should never be done in active pid patients in active genital tb patients and in suspected pregnancy patients now this is a the the, the uh, investigation of choice but jab hum hsg karte hain the tubes undergo spasm and that can lead to appearance of cornual block that is why the gold standard test for tubal patency is laparoscopic chromoperturbation it is not hsg hsg is investigation of choice gold standard is laparoscopic chromoperturbation in laparoscopic chromoperturbation hum vagina ke through we are going to pass a dye which is methylene blue dye and simultaneously hum upar se laparoscopy karenge so from vagina we will pass a dye 
एंड ऊपर से हम लैप्रोस्कोपी करेंगे टू सी वेदर द डाई इज कमिंग आउट और नॉट सो दिस ब्लू डाई विच यू आर सींग इज लैप इज यूज फॉर लैप्रोस्कोपिक क्रोमो परट्यूबेशन एंड द डाई विच यू आर यूजिंग इज मिथिलीन ब्लू डाई फॉर एच एस जी यू यूज यूरोग्राफेन राइट मीग सिंड्रोम इज नाउ प्लीज रिमेंबर दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट डिफरेंस बिटवीन मीग एंड स्यूडो मीग इफ यू आर अ मैरो स्टूडेंट यू नो दिस वेरी वेल मीग सिंड्रोम देर आर फोर ओवेरियन कैंसर्स जिनके साथ इफ यू आर गेटिंग राइट साइडेड प्लूरल इफ्यूजन एंड असाइटिस यू कॉल इट एज मीग सिंड्रोम वॉट आर द फोर ओवेरियन कैंसर्स फाइब्रोमास थिकोमास Brenner's tumor and granulosa cell tumor. So, in case of fibroma, I'm writing it just quickly, properly for you here. So, if you have a fibroma, a thicoma, a granulosa cell tumor, or a Brenner tumor, and along with this, you are getting right-sided pleural effusion. plus ascites then this is what is called as meex syndrome right fibroma is a solid benign stromal tumor ye stroma ka tumor hota hai and it is solid and benign thicoma is a malignant stromal tumor right then you have a granulosa cell tumor which is again malignant and brenner's tumor brenner tumor is a benign epithelial tumor clear okay so this granulosa cell tumor is a malignant sex cord tumor now if you are getting if you get right side pleural effusion plus ascites with any other condition then that is what is called as pseudo meeg syndrome pseudo meeg syndrome right now look over here meeg syndrome is so i told you it has to be a fibroma or a brenner's tumor or a granulosa cell tumor or a thicoma along with ascites and hydrothorax ab do options hain fibroma ke benign and malignant fibroma is always a benign tumor so the answer is benign fibroma plus ascites plus hydrothorax right instead of benign fibroma yahan pe kya ho sakta tha it could have been malignant thicoma it could have been benign brenner's tumor or it could have been malignant granulosa cell tumor then also i would have called it as meeg syndrome clear no brenner's is not associated with pseudo meeg but so this is a change which has happened fibroma thicoma brenner granulosa cell in charon ke sath if you are getting ascites and hydrothorax that is meek right inke alawa if you are getting right sided pleural effusion and ascites due to any other reason then that's pseudo meek next bartholin cyst is located on so all of you know bartholin cyst is located in vestibule right so bartholin cyst is located in vestibule bartholin gland ka another naam kya hota hai greater vestibular gland what is the other name for bartholin gland greater vestibular gland greater vestibular gland or bartholin gland it is homologous to it is homologous to cowper's gland which gland is homologous to prostate gland so it is the para urethral glands which are also called as skin glands skin glands are homologous to prostate gland right bartholin cyst everything other than that i have already told you identify the instrument now this is very easy what you are seeing over here is a curette so this over here is a curette 
Next, there was a question where they had shown you this instrument and they had asked you that the least likely use of this instrument. Now, in this instrument, what you are seeing, you are seeing that over here, this is a long instrument which has a bent. So, it is bent and this will have an olive tip. This is a uterine sound. This is a uterine sound. Now, the uses of uterine sound are, so this is how you recognize a uterine sound. It is not straight. It has a smooth angle. It has an olive tip and it is calibrated. Now, the uses of uterine sound are, uterine sound helps you to know the direction of the uterus before you do procedures like DNC or before you insert IUCD. Number two, it can be used as the first dilator of the os. Number three, it can be used for uterine anomalies like uterine septum ko detect karne ke liye. Number four, it can be used to confirm the position of misplaced IUCD. So if I am not sure ki IUCD is inside the uterus or outside the uterus, I can take a uterine sound and then do an ultrasound, right? To see whether the IUCD is near the uterine sound or it is not near the uterine sound, right? So these are the uses of uh, uterine sound. So, it can be used for dilatation and curettage. Yes. So, before doing a dilatation and curettage, I can use uterine sound. Before suction evacuation, I can use a uterine sound to know the length of the uterus and the position of the uterus. For removing IUCD, I can use a uterine sound. For endometrial biopsy, for endometrial biopsy in India, we use Carmen's cannula. In India, we are using Carmen's cannula. Abroad, we are they are using pipe, a pipet, a pipel, or a vabra aspirator. A vabra aspirator, right? But in India, we are using a Carmen's cannula for endometrial biopsy. So this is the least likely use of a uterine sound. Epithelial lining of fallopian tube. That's a very simple question. The lining is ciliated columnar epithelium. Please remember there are two named cells which are present in fallopian tube. They are peg cells and interstitial cells of cajal. Peg cells ka function hume nahi pata. Interstitial cells of cajal, they are the pacemaker cells and they help to initiate fallopian tube contractions, right? So, there are two named cells which are present in fallopian tube, pec cells and interstitial cells of cajal. The lining of fallopian tube is ciliated columnar. Identify the arrow marked in this image. So, you have to tell whether it is a primary follicle or a primordial follicle or a preantral follicle or an antral follicle. So, remember. Now, it's a very, very simple thing. Now, whenever you have a follicle and you have a single layer a single layer so this is a primary oocyte which is surrounded by a single layer of flat cells that is a primordial follicle jaise hi a single layer of cells cuboidal mein convert ho jate hain you call it as a primary follicle, right? Jaise hi ye single layer ki jaga multiple layers ho jati hai. And you start getting theca cells also. So now you are getting granulosa cells and theca cells. This is called as a secondary follicle, right? A secondary follicle is also called as a preantral follicle, right? So, now when you are going to get, now if you get a cavity, the moment you start seeing a cavity and you will have multiple layers, yehi granulosa cells ki layers milengi, and you are going to get theca cell ki proper layer. So, you are getting theca cell, granulosa cell and you are getting an antral cavity. This is what is called as antral follicle. And when the antral follicle is going to grow, 
and when antral follicle becomes 18 to 20 mm in size it is called as graafian follicle so just before ovulation antral follicle will become 18 to 20 mm in size and it will be called as graafian follicle so we start from primordial follicle primordial follicle mein there is a primary oocyte which is surrounded by a single layer of cells jo ki flat hote hain then a primary follicle jisme ye cells cuboidal ho jate hain then you come to a secondary follicle or a preantral follicle jisme you get multiple layers of granulosa cell and some theca cells and then a cavity appears and that is what is called as antral follicle right now in this image when you zoom this image you are seeing a cavity do you see a cavity over here now the moment you see a cavity it means it's an antral follicle right so this is an antral follicle so the answer over here is option d kyunki jab hum zoom kar rahe hain hame ek cavity dikhai de rahi hai now if cavity is seen it means it's an antral follicle please do not say preantral preantral ka matlab hai you will not see any cavity right okay then which of the following is not true about colostrum so if you are a marrow subscriber or if you have watched my videos or if you have attended my classes i tell you to remember just one thing about colostrum i tell you everything is more in colostrum only kfc is less in colostrum everything is more in colostrum in comparison to breast milk whether it is immunoglobulins whether it is a, uh, you know anything everything is more in colostrum in comparison to breast milk except kfc what is kfc k stands for potassium f stands for fat and c stands for carbohydrates so kfc is less in colostrum in comparison to breast milk right so over here it is saying which of the following is not true about colostrum colostrum contains iga yes it is lemon yellow in color yes it has high amount of sugar and fat no right so the uh, incorrect answer is high amount of sugar and fat so over here your option d is what you have to choose clear coming to the last paper where there were only 16 questions fmg june 2022 okay now uh, do you want to take a 5 minutes break or a 2 minutes break over here want to drink water just have water and then i'll quickly start june 2022 fmg paper hormone deficiencies in what have you written in and so i can't even read hormone deficiencies in ambiguous genitalia hormone deficiencies in ambiguous genitalia i uh, don't understand which hormone deficiencies you want to understand matlab you want to and what do you want me to tell you okay so i am not taking a break i'm just having some water you people also if you want to have water just have water and we'll start june 2022 I will try to give you this PDF on my Telegram channel. I'll upload today's. I mean, if I am able to do, I am very bad on these technical aspects. If I am uh, able to uh, put it on my Telegram channel, I'll I'll upload this PDF on my Telegram channel. why methyl ergometrin is contraindicated in rh negative pregnancy see methyl ergometrin has two drawbacks one is it leads to high bp 
that is why it is contraindicated in preeclampsia and in eclampsia the other drawback of methyl ergometrin is it leads to tetanic contractions in the uterus oxytocin kya karta hai when you give oxytocin oxytocin leads to contraction and then relaxation contraction and then relaxation lekin methyl ergometrin if you are giving it leads to tetanic contractions in the uterus so when it leads to tetanic contraction in the uterus whatever blood is there in the uterus it goes back into mother's circulation right that is why in heart disease you are never going to give methyl ergometrin because at is as it is cardiac output is very high ab agar uterus ka pura ka pura blood is going to go into mother circulation it will lead to heart failure number 2 same problem in rh negative if it leads to tetanic contractions there are increased chances of feto maternal blood getting mixed that is why it is not given explain congenital adrenal hyperplasia acha bhai congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a big topic okay at the end of the session i i'll take 5 minutes and i'll try to explain it to you uh, in an easy manner i will explain it to you don't worry in the last i'll explain congenital adrenal hyperplasia in an easy manner although i feel ki congenital adrenal hyperplasias pay in fmg questions which are asked are few you know i have not in the past few years i have not seen uh, Uh, questions on congenital adrenal hyperplasia in fmg in ini set and in neat they are very oftenly asked but still i will explain okay so coming to your june 2022 question number 1 which hyperthyroid drug is safer during first trimester of pregnancy so whenever they are talking about hyperthyroid drugs so remember drug of choice for hyperthyroidism in pregnancy if this is a plain simple question they ask you what is the drug of choice for hyperthyroidism in pregnancy your answer is going to be propyl thiouracil if they ask you drug of choice for hyperthyroidism in first trimester again the answer is going to be propyl thiouracil if they say drug of choice for hyperthyroidism in second or third trimester then the answer is going to be methimazole or carbimazole right now carbimazole and methiprazole they lead to one problem that is why they are not used in first trimester and that is aplasia cutis another very important question is radioactive iodine is contraindicated in pregnancy they can ask you what is the rda rda is routine daily allowance of iodine in pregnancy routine daily allowance of iodine in pregnancy is 250 micrograms per day right and the last thing which you have to remember is suppose there is a hypothyroid female who was taking thyroxin and she conceives so what is what are you going to do to the dose of thyroxin so in all hypothyroid females when they conceive the dose of thyroxin should be increased right telegram channel's name is i think dr sakshi uh, just just let me check there are so many channels and so many things just just let me check uh, obgy by sakshi arora hans obg OBG by Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans, right? I'll share the link uh, in this. I mean, in the comment section. Okay. So over here, your question was, which hyperthyroid drug is safer during first trimester? Propyl thiouracil, methimazole, and carbimazole. They can lead to aplasia cutis and radioactive iodine is contraindicated. Next question. which among the following is the most common cause of post menopausal bleeding please if a question comes like this most common cause of post menopausal bleeding is endometrial atrophy which is also called as senile endometritis right 
most common cancer causing pmb in india that's cancer cervix but most common cause of pmb is endometrial atrophy or senile endometritis what do you understand by pmb pmb is any bleeding which is happening after menopause so you people have understood it wrong koi kehta hai 6 months ke baad bleeding ho rahi hai to pmb 1 month ke baad bleeding ho rahi hai pmb no any bleeding which is happening after a patient attains menopause that is post menopausal bleeding and if they ask you what is the next step when a patient of pmb comes to you the next step is you should do a trans vaginal sonography and on trans vaginal sonography you should look at the endometrial thickness if endometrial thickness is more than 4 mm then you should go for endometrial biopsy right so in all patients with pmb if they ask you what is the next step do not jump to endometrial biopsy first step which you have to do is tvs and on tvs if it is uh, the thickness is more than 4 mm then you do endometrial biopsy now which is the common duration of secondary pph as i told you that pph can be primary or it can be secondary if it is happening within 24 hours it is primary if it is happening after 24 hours but up till 12 weeks it is secondary so this was a very very easy question 24 hours to 12 weeks is secondary pph what is the most common cause of primary pph it is atonic uterus what is the most common cause of secondary pph it is retained placental tissue right what is maternal mortality rate in india 103 right next question the legal requirement for mtp includes approval of two doctors among the following which time period best suits for this requirement so abhi we were talking about mtp amendment act right mtp amendment came in 2021 and according to this mtp amendment the changes jo aaye hain changes abhi we have done just now i told you a few of these changes that now mtp can be done up till 24 weeks if pregnancy is due to contraceptive failure then mtp is done still only up till 20 weeks if it is due to severe congenital anomalies there is no upper limit to do mtp a single doctor's opinion is needed till 20 weeks between 20 to 24 weeks two doctors opinion is needed if you are doing mtp for severe congenital anomalies then the medical board is formed and that medical board has four members and un charo ki opinion is needed right so over here they are saying two doctors opinion now two doctors opinion is needed between 20 to 24 weeks a very important thing which i want you to remember is what are the qualifications for doing mtp any registered medical practitioner who has assisted in 25 cases of mtp in which in 5 cases he or she should have been the primary surgeon that is one requirement or any registered medical practitioner who has done house job in obs and gynae for 6 months can do mtp or any person any mbbs person who has either ms in uh, obgy or md in obgy or dnb in obgy or a dgo so if there is a diploma or a degree of obs and gynae then these three category of doctors are eligible to do mtp all mtp records for how long you should save them you should save them for 5 years clear next question A 34-year-old presents at six weeks of delivery. She wants contraception for next three years. What will be the best contraceptive method in this case? Right now, very important because it has been asked in your December to, no sorry June 2022 exam is contraception in the postpartum period. So I am just going to take five minutes to explain you this question. Now when you are using contraceptive after delivery in a fully breastfeeding female contraceptive should begin 3 months after delivery in a partially breastfeeding female or in a female who is not breastfeeding right the contraceptive should begin 3 months after delivery right now 
in case of iucd when can you put iucd in a female who has recently delivered you can put iucd in a female within 48 hours of delivery if you put iucd within 48 hours of delivery that is called as postpartum insertion lekin agar aapne 48 hours mein iucd nahi dala to then you cannot put till put up till 6 weeks after delivery right so either you put it within 48 hours of delivery or you put the iucd after 6 weeks of delivery now there are two iucds which we have copper iucd and progesterone iucd which is mirena remember mirena is the most effective amongst all contraceptive methods right the failure rate of mirena is 0.05% and kyunki mirena mein progesterone hota hai progesterone has no effect on breast milk right progesterone will have no effect on breast milk clear now when we talk about ocps ocps that is estrogen and progesterone containing pills they have two problems number one they decrease breast milk and number two there are increased chances of venous thromboembolism that is why in a fully breastfeeding female they are absolutely contraindicated till 6 weeks ideally an ocp should be given to a fully breastfeeding female from 6 months onwards right even if the female is not breastfeeding or partially breastfeeding still i will be uh, you know thinking whether to give ocp or not why because ocps lead to increased chances of venous thromboembolism and as it is in pregnancy the clotting factors were high so even if the female is not breastfeeding i am not worried about ki breast milk kam ho jayega because she is not breastfeeding i am worried about venous thromboembolism and that is why ocps are absolutely contraindicated at less than 3 weeks of delivery ideally they should be started at more than equal to 6 weeks if a female is not breastfeeding right now when it comes to progesterone containing contraceptives a progesterone containing contraceptives like pops like implants pops and implants progesterone ka koi problem nahi hai progesterone na to breast milk decrease karta hai na hi progesterone embolism cause karta hai right so progesterone containing contraceptives whether it was pop whether it is a progesterone implant you can start from day 1 of delivery राइट right? चाहे वो ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग कर रही है या नहीं कर रही है हार्डली मैटर्स इन ऑल फीमेल्स आफ्टर डिलीवरी यू कैन स्टार्ट पीओपीज और प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन इम्प्लांट कैन बी पुट फ्रॉम डे वन एज फार एज इंजेक्शन इज कंसर्न डी एम पी ए इज कंसर्न डी एम पी ए में केवल एक ही प्रॉब्लम है डीएमपीए जब आप यूज करते हो इट इन डिक्रीजेस द बोन मिनरल डेंसिटी दैट इज वाई इन अ ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग फीमेल इट इज कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड टिल सिक्स वीक्स आफ्टर डिलीवरी राइट सो इन अ जस्ट आई हैव टोल्ड यू कि आईयूसीडीज कैन बी पुट विद इन फोर्टी एट आवर्स ऑफ डिलीवरी और दे कैन बी पुट आफ्टर सिक्स वीक्स ऑफ डिलीवरी राइट ओसेपीज आइडली ओसेपीज को इन अ ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग फीमेल हमें सिक्स मंथ्स आफ्टर डिलीवरी स्टार्ट करना चाहिए बट दे आर एब्सोल्यूटली कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड टिल सिक्स वीक्स आफ्टर डिलीवरी बट इन अ ब्रेस्ट फीडिंग फीमेल आई एम गोइंग टू स्टार्ट इट आइडली आफ्टर सिक्स मंथ्स प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन कंटेनिंग पिल हो या इम्प्लांट हो यू कैन स्टार्ट इट फ्रॉम डे वन ऑफ डिलीवरी राइट एंड इंजेक्शन डीएमपीए in a breast feeding female you should start from 6 weeks after delivery now with this knowledge let us come to this question your question is saying patient has come to you 6 weeks after delivery and she wants a contraception for next 3 years so lactational amenorrhea is not an answer right ab because patient breast feed karegi so injectable progesterone is also not an option because injectable progesterone ka matlab hai after every 2 months you have to give the injection also and she wants a contraceptive for 3 years now i am left with two options copper t de ki iucd with 
progesterone de right now if you ask me both of them can be given you can give copper tea also and you can give mirena also mirena ka advantage ye hai ki it is the most effective contraceptive method so it's most effective contraceptive method and if since it is the most effective contraceptive method i would prefer giving her mirena now clear to all of you since it is the most effective contraceptive method its failure rate is 0.05% so i am going to prefer giving her mirena in comparison to copper iucd ab problem kahan aati hai problem ye aati hai that when you give mirena the patient experiences amenorrhea patient continuously amenorrhea mein chala jata hai right patient has amenorrhea patient will not have any bleeding right and because patient will not have any bleeding she will not be very uh, you know uh, a patient wants bleeding so that she is sure that pregnancy has not happened right and on top of that patient ne abhi abhi delivery kari hai so she wants to be very sure that i am not pregnant and humne usko aisa contraceptive de diya jo ki amenorrhea cause kar raha hai she will always be very tensed right and that is why the preferred contraceptive is copper tea because copper tea se patient will have bleeding so she will be sure that uske she uski periods aayenge so she will be sure that she is not pregnant although mirena is the most efficacious efficacious one maximum efficacy mirena ki hoti hai but still over here the answer will be copper tea clear Which of the following drug is used for MTP for a 20 year female who has come to you in early weeks of pregnancy and just now we did that medical abortion ke liye uh, you are going to use 200 mg of mifepristone and early weeks mein we use 400 micrograms of mesoprost and later on we use 800 micrograms of mesoprost and yahan pe keval ek hi option tha jisme 200 mg of mifepristone diya tha which was option C and that was with 800 micrograms of mesoprost so i am marking that as the answer identify the image now in this image it is very clear what you are seeing you are seeing that the placenta is covering the os and because placenta is covering the os this is a case of placenta previa nowadays we do not use uh, you know uh, type 1 type 2 type 3 or type 4 placenta previa nowadays we use only two terminologies low lying placenta and placenta previa low lying placenta ka kya matlab hai low lying placenta ka matlab hai ki placenta is within 2 cm of the internal os but it is not touching the internal os right and placenta previa ka kya matlab hai placenta reaches up till the edges of the internal os or it covers the internal os that is placenta previa right then a 24 year old patient presented in emergency room with fully outside cervix so her uterus was outside and a cystocele what is the next step in management now please understand that this patient is coming to you in emergency room right cystocele ki patient agar emergency room mein aa rahi hai this means she is coming to you with urinary retention right because there is urinary retention that is why she is coming to you and if they are asking you what is the next step to emergency room mein aane ke baad hum usko cystocele repair ke liye nahi le jayenge next step will not be cystocele repair next step is going to be that i am going to put a foley's catheter and i am going to make her uterus be inside because if the uterus is inside she will be able to pass her urine otherwise har thode din baad jab tak ka hum surgery nahi karte tab tak ka every time she will have urinary retention so that usko next time ab urinary retention na ho is bar urinary retention ke liye to hum foley's catheter dalenge and so that ab aage urinary retention na ho i want the uterus to be in a normal position and that is why i am going to put a pessary 
right so this is the next step in management foley's catheterization plus a pessary so a pessary for temporary relief what if they ask you what is the management of cystocele now whenever they ask you management of cystocele management of cystocele in all age groups is anterior colporaphy similarly management of urethrocele in all age groups is anterior colporaphy management of rectocele is posterior colpoperineuraphy and management of enterocele is moscovitz repair moscovitz repair right now please remember cystocele ho ya urethrocele ho ya enterocele ho ya rectocele ho inka management same hota hai for all age groups right but in case of uterine prolapse in case of uterine prolapse management differ karta hai in different age groups first of all uterine prolapse should be managed only if it is a third degree uterine prolapse right now if there is a third degree uterine prolapse which is happening in a young female jisme child bearing is not completed then the prolapse is managed by a sling surgery or cervicopexy if it is a reproductive age female who jisko prolapse hua hai her child bearing is complete right then the management is father gills repair if it is a post menopausal female with a third degree prolapse management is hysterectomy if it is a post menopausal female with comorbidities like usko diabetes hai ya heart disease hai and usko third degree prolapse hua hai then it is leifort's colpoclysis now if there is a pregnant female or a postpartum female with prolapse or if there is a female who is very elderly who is more than 65 years of age and she has a prolapse then the management is pessary this pessary is only for temporary relief and it has to be changed after every 3 months clear identify the image now in this image what you are seeing is that there is a connection which is present between the bladder and vagina now because a connection is present yes if a patient is more than a 65 you have to do a give a pessary so whether she is 80 or whether it is more than 65 you have to give a pessary now over here you are seeing a connection between the bladder and vagina and that is what is visico vaginal fistula so this over here is bladder this is uterus this is vagina right and this over here is a visico vaginal fistula now in case of visico vaginal fistula so there are basically three kinds of fistulas which on which question can come a urethro vaginal fistula visico vaginal fistula and urethro vaginal fistula urethro vaginal fistula ka matlab hai ki ureter and vagina ke beech mein fistula hai in this case patient will complain of dribbling of urine plus she will have normal urination so there will be continuous dribbling of urine and normal urination and when you will do a methylene blue test you will see that the upper swab is wet but there is no color right in case of visico vaginal fistula when the fistula is between bladder and vagina the patient will come to you with dribbling of urine but there will be no normal urination so kabhi bhi patient ko normal urination nahi hoga only dribbling of urine hoga jabki in urethro vaginal fistula normal urination bhi hoga and dribbling bhi hoga and when you will do a methylene blue 3 swab test in visico vaginal fistula middle swab will be wet plus blue in color in case of urethro vaginal fistula there is no continuous dribbling of urine there is no continuous dribbling of urine 
patient will complain of urine coming out from urethra and vagina at the time of urination so patient will say that when i sit for urination urine comes out from my vagina also and when you will do a methylene blue 3 swab test so in a methylene blue 3 swab test the lower most cotton swab will be wet plus blue now if they ask you what is the best investigation for vesicovaginal fistula it is cystoscopy right what is the most common cause of vvf in india most common cause of vvf in india is obstructed labor that's the most common cause of vvf in india right next question who defines maternal death as so how does who define maternal death who defines maternal death as death during pregnancy and within six weeks of delivery please remember maternal mortality rate in india is 103 and the most common cause of maternal mortality is obstetrical hemorrhage in obstetrical hemorrhage the most common is postpartum hemorrhage then a couple came to clinic with complaint of infertility on examination her husband had gynecomastia and tall stature what is the possible diagnosis now they had given you option of Kleinfelter, turner swires and testicular feminizing syndrome remember Ki turners, swires and androgen insensitivity syndrome which is testicular feminizing syndrome bhi kehte hain. In all these cases your patient is a female patient. So phenotypically patient is female patient. Right and patient primary amenorrhea ki tarike se aayegi. राइट right? कभी भी ऐसा नहीं होगा कि वो एक मेल होगा टर्नर सिंड्रोम की पेशेंट इज अ फीमेल पेशेंट स्वायर सिंड्रोम की पेशेंट इज अ फीमेल पेशेंट एंड एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी सिंड्रोम की पेशेंट इज अ फीमेल पेशेंट सो इफ यू नो दिस मच यू नो दैट द आंसर इज गोइंग टू बी क्लाइन फेल्टर सिंड्रोम बिकॉज यहां पे क्वेश्चन कह रहा है कि द पेशेंट्स हस्बैंड वाज टॉल एंड हैड गायनेकोमास्टिया राइट सो दिस इज व्हाट यू गेट इन क्लाइन फेल्टर सिंड्रोम in klein felter syndrome the uh, chromosome number is 47 xxy and because they have y chromosome they are males and they have testes as their uh, gonads right these testes are small and they are hypoplastic that is why there is testicular failure and that is why there is infertility these individuals they have tall stature and they have long limbs and because they have x chromosomes so they have gynac some female features like gynecomastia and high pitched voice so Kleinfelter syndrome ke patients are male patients who are tall who have long limbs and they have testes the testes are small and hypoplastic they have two x chromosomes so they have gynecomastia and they have a high pitched voice right on the other hand turner's syndrome swire's syndrome and androgen insensitivity syndrome phenotypically that means physical appearance wise all of them are females and they come to you with complaint of primary amenorrhea the most common cause of primary amenorrhea is turner's syndrome turner's syndrome pe jab bhi question aayega question aayega that patient has come to you with primary amenorrhea and she has short stature right they may say ki webbing of neck present hai uterus will be present and their gonads will be ovaries but ovaries will not be functioning properly there will be streak ovaries and 
these streak ovaries will produce decreased estrogen and kyunki estrogen nahi hoga that is why breast development will be absent and because estrogen nahi hoga so the negative feedback on fsh will go and so the fsh levels are high so this is what you have to remember in turner syndrome primary amenorrhea short stature streak gonads streak gonads that means less estrogen that means breast development not proper and that means that uh, fsh levels are high uterus is present in turner syndrome now then comes swyer's syndrome swyer's syndrome is 46 xy now because it is 46 xy that is why the gonads are testes but again they come to you as a case of female with primary amenorrhea differentiate kaise karoge turner syndrome se they will have normal stature rest everything is same between turners and swyers kya difference hota hai turners and swyers mein turners is 45 xo टर्नर्स में स्ट्रीक ओवरीज होती हैं एंड टर्नर्स में शॉर्ट स्टेचर होता है स्वायर्स इज 46 एक्स वाई उसमें टेस्टीज होती हैं एंड नॉर्मल स्टेचर होता है बाकी दोनों में सब कुछ सेम होता है दोनों में यूट्रस प्रेजेंट होता है दोनों में एफएसएच लेवल्स हाई होते हैं एंड दोनों में ब्रेस्ट डिवेलपमेंट इज एबसेंट राइट सो दिस इज हाउ यू कम टू नो वेदर इट इज टर्नर्स और स्वायर्स बेस्ड ऑन टेस्टीज एंड ओवरीज based on normal stature and short stature and based on chromosome number then comes androgen insensitivity syndrome androgen insensitivity syndrome may again it is 46 xy the gonads are testes right but their uterus is absent they will never have a uterus breast development in may proper breast development hoga जबकि स्वायर्स में ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट नहीं था राइट स्वायर्स में यूट्रस प्रेजेंट था ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट प्रेजेंट नहीं था एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी में यूट्रस प्रेजेंट नहीं है बट ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट इज प्रॉपर ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट एंड प्यूबिक हेयर इज लेस सो प्रॉपर ब्रेस्ट डिवेलपमेंट बट लेस प्यूबिक हेयर स्वायर्स में तो ना तो प्यूबिक हेयर होता है ना ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट होता है टर्नर्स में भी ना तो प्यूबिक हेयर होता है ना ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट होता है राइट right? लेकिन एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी में ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट होता है बट प्यूबिक हेयर नहीं होता एंड आई एक्सप्लेन इट टू यू अर्लियर ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट इसलिए होता है बिकॉज एंड्रोजन गेट कन्वर्टेड इन टू ईस्ट्रोजन एंड ईस्ट्रोजन इज नीडेड फॉर ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट एंड दीज इंडिविजुअल्स आर इन सेंसिटिव टू एंड्रोजन एंड्रोजन आर नीडेड फॉर प्यूबिक हेयर दैट इज वाई प्यूबिक हेयर इज नॉट देयर राइट now a patient with breast cancer treatment uh, who was on tamoxifen she now presents with complaints of bleeding per vagina what is the most likely cause please remember tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator drug which can lead to endometrial cancer very very important tamoxifen can lead to endometrial cancer okay someone is asking me androgen insensitivity syndrome versus mullerian agenesis very easy let us see androgen is 46 xy mullerian is 46 xx dono mein uterus absent right gonads in androgen insensitivity testes over here ovaries ब्रेस्ट डेवलपमेंट दोनों में प्रेजेंट प्यूबिक हेयर एबसेंट इन एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी प्रेजेंट इन मुलेरियन एजेनेसिस रीनल अनोमलीज प्रेजेंट इन मुलेरियन एजेनेसिस एबसेंट इन एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी सिंड्रोम राइट सो एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी सिंड्रोम एंड अच्छा ना इफ यू लुक एट टेस्टोस्टेरॉन लेवल्स इन एंड्रोजन इन सेंसिटिविटी बिकॉज ये मेल्स हैं मतलब ये 46 एक्स वाई है राइट सो दैट इज वाई इन कंपेरिजन टू अ फीमेल द लेवल्स ऑफ टेस्टोस्टेरॉन विल बी वेरी हाई यहां पर नॉर्मल टेस्टोस्टेरॉन लेवल्स होंगे 
right cleared all of you yes okay next question this instrument is used for abhi abhi humne kiya this is a leech wilkinson cannula and this leech wilkinson cannula is used for hsg next question retrodrine to prevent premature labor will cause all of the following complications in mother except so what is retrodrine retrodrine all of you know from your pharma knowledge that this is a beta 2 agonist right so uh, it is a beta 2 agonist and all beta 2 agonists can lead to tachycardia they can lead to tremors they can lead to pulmonary edema they do not lead to hypoglycemia they lead to hyperglycemia what is the tocolytic of choice in india tocolytic of choice in india is nifedipine please remember all tocolytics should be given only for 48 hours and tocolytics should never be given in pregnancies which are more than 34 weeks so you don't give tocolytics in pregnancies which are more than 34 weeks endomethacin is also a tocolytic endomethacin should never be given for more than 32 weeks it should never be given beyond 32 weeks why because if endomethacin is given beyond 32 weeks it leads to premature closure of ductus arteriosus right so tocolytic of choice is nifedipine tocolytics should only be given for 48 hours and they should never be given after 34 weeks what is the role of tocolytics tocolytics ka keval ek hi role hota hai they give time for corticosteroids to act so they buy time when i want to buy time for corticosteroids to act then i am going to give tocolytics and i am going to give tocolytics only up till 48 hours not more than that and never am i going to give tocolytics after 34 weeks endomethacin is a tocolytic which should never be given beyond 32 weeks because it can lead to premature closure of ductus arteriosus please remember progesterone is not a tocolytic it can prevent preterm labor but it cannot treat preterm labor once the contractions begin so do not say progesterone is a tocolytic progesterone is not a tocolytic right then identify the image now in this image what you are seeing in this image you are seeing that a dye was passed ye hsg ka cannula hai dye pass hua and dye pass hone ke baad beech mein nahi aaya in the uterus and over here it didn't come this is something which is called as filling defect filling defect i am seeing that the dye didn't come at some places inside the uterus so remember in hsg you know in hsg if you are getting multiple small irregular filling defects that is called as moth eaten appearance then you are dealing with a case of ascherman syndrome if you are getting a single defect which is very smooth and regular then that means it's a case of fibroid or polyp right if you are getting lead pipe appearance beaded appearance tobacco pouch appearance golf stick appearance cotton wool appearance or bilateral cornwall block then that is genital tb in genital tb hum hum hsg nahi karte but by chance i am not knowing my patient has genital tb and if i do hsg what are the typical findings which you get on hsg in genital tb ye naam yaad karne hain lead pipe appearance beaded appearance tobacco pouch appearance golf stick appearance cotton wool appearance or bilateral cornwall block so hsgs ke bare mein keval itna yaad rakhna hai ki agar multiple irregular filling defects mil rahe hain to ascherman syndrome single smooth regular filling defect mil raha hai to either it is fibroid or polyp aur agar inme se koi word diya gaya hai to that is genital tb 
अब यहां पे आई एम सींग टू डिफेक्ट इट इज नॉट अ सिंगल डिफेक्ट एंड इट इज इेगुलर दैट मीन्स दिस इज अ केस ऑफ एशर मैन सिंड्रोम राइट इन केस ऑफ यूनिकॉर्नोवेट यूट्रस यू गेट अ बनाना शेप्ड यूट्रस यू गेट अ बनाना शेप्ड यूट्रस इन अ यूनिकॉर्नोवेट यूट्रस राइट ऑन एच एस जी सो एच एस जी में यू आर गोइंग टू गेट एन इमेज लाइक दिस अ बनाना शेप्ड यूट्रस इतना सा दिखेगा एक साइड की फेलोपियन ट्यूब दिखेगी राइट सो यू आर गोइंग टू गेट बनाना शेप्ड यूट्रस प्लस सिंगल फेलोपियन ट्यूब सो किसी भी एच एस जी में सिंगल फेलोपियन ट्यूब दिखे इट मीन्स इट इज यूनिकॉर्नोवेट यूट्रस राइट यहां पर आई कैन सी कि ये आई वॉन्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू फर्स्ट लुक एट दिस एच एस जी वेरी केयरफुली This over here is one fallopian tube, and this is the dye coming out. And this over here is second fallopian tube and dye coming out. This means कि कोई blockage नहीं है. There is no block, right? So HSG के क्या-क्या uses होते हैं? HSG का number one use होता है कि हम blocks identify कर सकते हैं. And just now we did कि if you are getting bilateral coronal block. most common causes spasm second uh, most common causes genital tb if you are getting a fimbrial block then that is mostly due to salpingitis due to gonorrhea is hsg mein koi block nahi hai is hsg mein hame dye niche aati hui dikh rahi hai right in this hsg i can see the uterus properly i can see two fallopian tubes that means it is not any uterine anomaly kyunki agar uh, uniconvoid uterus hota to i would have got a banana shaped uterus and i would have got a single fallopian tube right this is not a normal hsg because i am getting a filling defect uh septate and bicornuate okay now septate and bicornuate they are very difficult to differentiate on hsg agar hsg mein so i want all of you to copy this if on hsg you are getting a single fallopian tube it means it is unicornuate uterus right if on hsg you are getting two fallopian tubes and simultaneously you see that there are fallopian tube to do hain a fallopian tube do to normally bhi hote hain and now what you are seeing is that there are two vaginas how do i come to know there are two vaginas because there are two leech wilkinson cannulas do leech wilkinson cannula use hue hain right then that means it is didelphus uterus i'll just now show you an image of didelphus uterus right where you will get two leech wilkinson cannulas right now if you see on hsg that there are two fallopian tubes single vagina but you are getting two uterus विजाइना सिंगल है लेकिन यूट्रस दो दिख रहे हैं राइट right? यहां पे विजाइना भी दो थे यूट्रस भी दो थे राइट सो नाउ इट कैन ईदर बी बायकॉर्नोवेट और इट कैन बी सेप्टेट यूट्रस नाउ इन अ बायकॉर्नोवेट यूट्रस यू विल गेट टू यूट्रस सिंगल विजाइना two fallopian tubes in septate uterus also you will get two fallopian tubes two uterus single vagina now how am i going to differentiate between them if the distance between the two horns is more than 4 cm and angle is more than 60 degrees so it's an obtuse angle 60 ki jagah bolo obtuse angle right 
if distance is less than 4 cm and there is an acute angle then it is septate uterus so if you are getting confused just let me check let me show you uh, some images <clears throat> So look here. What are you seeing in this image? In this image, what are you seeing? In this image, you are seeing this is a Leach Wilkinson cannula. You are seeing a banana shaped uterus and you are seeing a single fallopian tube. Because you are seeing a single fallopian tube, a banana shaped uterus, that means this is a case of unicornuate uterus. Right? Now I want you to look at this image. In this image, what you are seeing? In this image, you are seeing two fallopian tubes. Now, two fallopian tubes are showing, so it cannot be uniconvoid uterus, right? But I am seeing two uterus, two fallopian tubes. I am also seeing two vaginas because I am seeing two Leach-Wilkinson cannulas. Now, because there are two Leach-Wilkinson cannulas, that means it is a case of didelphus uterus. Clear to all of you? Yes. Now look at this image over here. In this image, I am seeing two fallopian tubes. Two fallopian tubes. So this cannot be uniconvoid uterus. I am seeing a single Leach Wilkinson cannula. So it cannot be didelphus. Now, either it is bicornuate or it is septate. Right? So now look at the angle between the two horns and the distance between the two horns. The angle between the two horns is obtuse and distance is more than 4 cm. This is bicornuate uterus. Compare it with this image over here. In this image, again, I am seeing two fallopian tubes, so it cannot be uniconvoid. I am seeing single Leach Wilkinson, it cannot be didelphus. So either it is bicornuate or septate. Now the distance between the two horns is less than 4 centimeters and it is acute angle, so this is septate uterus. Clear to all of you? Yes? Okay. So all your confusions gone? And if you are getting multiple filling defects, it is Asherman syndrome, single smooth filling defect, fibroid or polyp. Clear to all of you? Now, what will be the content in the given contraceptive? So the contraceptive given to you was today's sponge. All of you know that today's sponge has got 1 gram non-oxenol 9. And uh, the best part about uh, today's sponge and the most characteristic thing about uh, today's sponge is that once today's sponge is inserted, it can be used multiple times in that 24 hours. Ek bar 24 hours ke liye today's sponge ko jab ek female insert karti hai, she can use it for multiple times in that 24 hours. So this is one of the best contraceptive for a female sex worker, right? Maximum today's sponge can be left for 30 hours. But the chances of toxic shock syndrome are nil. If you do not remove it after 30 hours, the chances of toxic shock syndrome are nil. But the problem with today's sponge that why we don't say that this is the contraceptive of choice for a female sex worker is because today's sponge can protect against STD and PID but not HIV. That is why we don't call it as the contraceptive of choice for a female sex worker. Right? Then... 
what should be the treatment of 8 cm endometrial cyst so remember a chocolate cyst or an endometrioma it is never managed medically always you have to do a surgical management if the size of the cyst is less than 5 cm you don't have to do anything you have to just follow up with tvs but if size is more than equal to 5 cm you have to do a laparoscopic cystectomy so over here they have given 8 cm so i am going to do a cystectomy right you never do give a do medical management for a chocolate cyst or endometrioma right a typical thing about chocolate cyst is on ultrasound it cyst normally should appear pure black in color lekin a chocolate cyst will never appear pure black in color it will give you a picket picture like this which is called as ground glass appearance this क्वेश्चन में कभी कभी ग्राउंड ग्लास अपियरेंस की जगह दे कैन राइट असिस्ट विद होमोजीनस इंटरनल इकोज जब भी कहीं ये आए कि देर इज एन ओवेरियन सिस्ट विद होमोजीनस इंटरनल इकोज दैट मीन्स इट इज अ चॉकलेट सिस्ट ग्राउंड ग्लास अपियरेंस और होमोजीनस इंटरनल इकोज सो दैट ब्रिंग्स मी टू द एंड ऑफ टूडेज लॉन्ग सेशन विच वी हैड we have discussed all the pyqs all the best to all of you i'm sure all of you are going to do really well a few things which i want all of you to do is please do not wake up till late night tomorrow ye galti bilkul mat karna aisa bilkul mat karna ki so mat right you have to sleep on time tomorrow rather i would suggest ki aaj bhi time se so and get up early tomorrow morning and then tomorrow night sleep on time have a proper meal at night tomorrow don't stay hungry don't read anything new tomorrow don't get nervous just revise if you've made a 20th notebook revise that or just do previous year questions that is all what you need to do don't go for anything new now right so all the best to all of you i'm sure all of you are going to do really well please keep your admit cards ready please keep everything what you need for your exam at one place tomorrow day after tomorrow morning get up on time day after tomorrow morning you are not going to study anything just get up take your shower have some light snacks don't go empty stomach right take blessings of god take blessings of your parents and be confident and just write your exam and don't forget to send me your you know how your paper had been on instagram on instagram i'll be waiting for your messages that how your exam had gone all the best to all of you you are going to do really really well any questions which you want to ask uh yes you can see this video again tomorrow this video is going to be there and i'm also going to share the pdf uh, tomorrow with you uh, rather tonight i'll try to share this pdf on my telegram group all the best love you all so much a bit about ligaments and supports okay ligaments and supports of the uterus very easy kuch nahi karna isme remember the ligaments which support the uterus so there so if this over here is pubic symphysis this is sacrum and this is pelvic side wall this is the uterus so number one ligament is pubo cervical ligament number two is a ligament which is connecting uterus to the pelvic side wall this is called as mackin rots ligament this is also called as transverse cervical ligament and this is also called as cardinal ligament and then there is a ligament which connects uterus to posteriorly the sacrum which is called as utero sacral ligaments 
all these three are the main ligaments or the primary ligaments which support the uterus right out of this the most important is cardinal ligament overall if they ask you which is the most important support of the uterus overall the most important support of the uterus is levator ani muscle right now if there is a secondary support of the uterus these were primary supports along with levator ani that's the primary support secondary support is a ligament which is called as round ligament round ligament indirectly supports the uterus because it helps to keep the uterus in antiverted position as long as uterus is antiverted antiverted ka matlab there is uh, the uterus is flexed there is an angle between vagina and cervix and there is an angle between cervix and uterus right so the angle between vagina and cervix that is what is called as angle of antiversion yahan pe aage bladder hota hai as long as uterus is antiverted bladder usko fall nahi karne deta jaise hi uterus retroverted ho jata hai right वैसे ही it becomes easier to fall right so antiverted position helps to keep the uterus in helps preventing prolapse right so because round ligament keeps the uterus in antiverted position that is why it indirectly supports the uterus now a ligament which never supports the uterus never supports the uterus that is broad ligament broad ligament never supports the uterus right okay what instruments are important in instruments i want all of you to look at sims speculum cascos speculum then i want you to look at anterior vaginal wall retractor a uterine sound curet then i want all of you to look at ovum forceps right then uh, you should uh, look at cockers forceps kyunki cockers forceps is used for arm right then uh, you should look at uh, carmen's cannula many many times uh, they have asked you carmen's cannula then a myoma clamp look at a myoma clamp and uh, a myoma screw right so broadly these are the ones which are very very important okay ha then uh, episiotomy scissors very important that you look at the episiotomy scissors yes cockers is with teeth a cockers forcep mein there is one tooth like this and two teeth like this okay mva syringe to abhi abhi humne kiya so yes mva syringe you are going to look at it ha then you are going to look at ayers spatula and a brush a cervical brush endo cervical brush yes hegar's dilators are important clear now anything else Not, nothing it's done uh bishop score what do you want to know i mean there are bishop score i want all of you to remember biophysical score ke parameters you don't have to remember the details of bishop score you just need to know the parameters in bishop score and parameters in biophysical score iske alawa you don't need to remember the score in details clear 
ओके इमेजेस में लुक एट दी सीटीजी इमेज डेसेलरेशन अर्ली डेसेलरेशन लेट डेसेलरेशन एंड योर वेरिएबल डेसेलरेशन एंड साइनोसॉइडल हार्ट रेट पैटर्न ये तीन चार इमेजेस भी जरूर से देख लेना देन कोरियोनिक विलाई सैंपलिंग की इमेज एंड एमनियोसेंटिस की इमेज दीज इमेजेस आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर यू लुक एट दीज इमेजेस टेक केयर ऑल ऑफ यू वॉट इज यू आस्किंग हाउ टू रिमेंबर स्टेजिंग इन गाइनी कैंसर स्टेजिंग इन गाइनी कैंसर देखो यू डोंट गेट क्वेश्चन ऑन स्टेजिंग इन गाइनी कैंसर मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स यू विल नॉट गेट एनी क्वेश्चन इफ यू आर रिमेंबरिंग स्टेजिंग वेल एंड गुड अगर स्टेजिंग याद नहीं है तो रिमेंबर ओनली वॉट आई एम टेलिंग यू जस्ट नाउ इन कोरियो कार्सिनोमा रिमेंबर दैट लंग्स आर इन्वॉल्व इन स्टेज थ्री राइट इन एंडोमेट्रियल कैंसर रिमेंबर सर्विक्स इज इन्वॉल्व इन स्टेज टू राइट अब जो एंडोमेट्रियल कैंसर की स्टेज थ्री सी है एंड कैंसर सर्विक्स की जो स्टेज थ्री सी है दोनों की सेम है रिमेंबर थ्री सी वन का मतलब है पेल्विक लिम्फ नोड्स का इन्वॉल्वमेंट थ्री सी टू का मतलब है पैरा आयोटिक लिम्फ नोड्स का इन्वॉल्वमेंट राइट क्वेश्चन इनमें से ही आएंगे इसके अलावा नहीं आएंगे देन सुपरफिशियल इंग्वाइनल लिंफ नोड सुपरफिशियल इंग्वाइनल लिंफ नोड वेदर इट इज एंडोमेट्रियल कैंसर वेदर इट इज कैंसर सर्विक्स वेदर इट इज कैंसर ओवरी इन तीनों में दे आर इन्वॉल्व इन स्टेज फोर बी राइट तो लिंफ नोड कौन कौन से कैंसर में कब कब इन्वॉल्व होते हैं दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट सो लिंफ नोड यू हैव टू रिमेंबर then uh, you have to remember that in cancer cervix ureter is involved in stage 3 b right bladder is involved in stage 4 a so if you remember this much your purpose is done isse zyada nahi pucha jayega staging as such is not asked clear so all the best take care don't get nervous you people have studied so much that you are going to clear is time pe nervous mat ho just have confidence in yourself and that's it you know much more than what i even know at this point of time right so all the best to all of you